Just going to go over a few logistical points. Uh, we're live streaming, uh, FCC.gov slash live. The archive of the event will probably show up on our event page within two days. It's being live captioned as well. Um, if you have any questions, people watching online, send them to roundtables at FCC.gov. If you're using Twitter, Twitter, the hashtag is FCC Roundtables. So it's pretty easy. Just remember FCC Roundtables. Audience members who have questions, just raise your hand and one of our staff will come and give you an index card and uh, we'll give it to the moderator. All questions read aloud become part of the public record. And um, with, without further ado, Chairman Wheeler of the FCC. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you uh, to our panel for uh, joining us today and all of you who are here both um, literally and virtually. We've had great uh, participation and interest in this from around the country, uh, and we look forward to, uh, to more. I think we'll be showing up on the screen here the uh, roundtable uh, .gov as well as, um, as the uh, hashtag uh, FCC Roundtable to remind folks that uh, your thoughts, questions are, uh, are being sought uh, even if you're not in the room. Today is the third uh, Open Internet Roundtable. When we finish today, we'll be crashing on about 24 hours of dialogue and discussion of diverse opinions on this important topic. Um, I know because I've been here for every one of those hours or minutes, as the case may be, and I've even become uh, involved in some of those discussions um, and uh, look forward to today uh, the uh, input from uh, from this this panel a as well. As I have said before, the goal of these roundtables is to try and parse out the most meaningful and optimal solution to assure the openness of the Internet. And we must remind ourselves when we have that consideration that today there are no protections to assure an open Internet. So today what we will do is to address the economic issues. You know, there it is. It's just come up there. So everybody who is out there uh, in the... Uh, the cyber world, uh, there's the address to send your questions or your, uh, or your tweets. But, you know, if you, if you peel back the onion on almost any issue of national import, you will find economics. We are an economic-driven society. And so we are grateful to have a panel of distinguished economists and individuals who can reflect on the realities of the economic uh, environment in which open internet uh, exists. Um, and we look forward to, uh, to hearing from them. So I will, as a non-economist, get out of the way and let the people who know what they're talking about begin. Thank you to all of you for being here. Does know what I'm talking about mean me? Uh, um, hi. Uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Ch um, Chairman and, and everybody else, and thanks especially to the panelists and people <laughs> coming and people watching um, online. Um, I want to say a few things by way of introduction. Uh, first, uh, being by, by welcome, everybody, and the, the subtitle of this uh, economic session is called is Market Successes and Market Failures, and I'll say more about that title um, in introducing the, uh, the proceedings today. Um, we've had a number of these roundtables, as the chairman said, talking about policy issues, the relevance of wireless enforcement issues, engineering. Uh, I believe the legal roundtable is to come uh, next week. Um, 
So uh, w the way this is going to work basically is that after this introductory stuff, um, uh, each of the panelists um, will have a chance to um, talk about five minutes on basically just for like what's in some what they think the important things are economic issues are to keep in mind with this or how to think about this, um, or whatever. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, there have been some of these other roundtables that have had a number of panels. Um, perhaps, uh, unfortunately for these panelists, and I thank them for their generosity, they're on the hook the whole time. Um, so we'll be taking a couple of breaks, uh, two or three breaks here and there to give everybody a chance to stretch their legs uh, and so on. Um, after these, these introductory statements, again with some breaks interspersed, um, they'll be, I'll be asking some questions here. Um, basically as ways to kind of prompt discussions, hopefully among them, uh, to help kind of clarify what's really going on here and, and a lot of the, the issues, the complications, the assumptions, the evidence, things like that. The first set will be things that are sort of foundational. I'll explain in a second why I'm going back to that. Things like competition, what people know about costs, what people think about the so-called fast lane issue, access pricing in general, discrimination incentives, um, uh, a little bit perhaps on interconnection issues, technical side of that, consumer information, network externalities. You know, uh, there have been some doubts about how this was going to take up an afternoon. When you start making this list, it's not quite so hard to imagine how it could take up an afternoon. And that doesn't get to remedies. Issues like what do people think about transparency or minimum quality standards or non-discrimination rules? What role of experimentation is there? What should the test of success be? You know, um, consumer benefit, total benefit, deployment could be a number of things. Do people think if there's any unintended consequences? And one thing, one issue that that if, if there's time to talk about would be um, one of the things that, that sort of frames how economists think about problems like this to assume people are profit maximizers. And what happens if you know, should we think about about possibilities in case if that's not true? Um, uh, and may I say a little bit more about why I think that is a potentially important issue? We're booked till five. We'll see how long this goes. If the six distinguished panelists here figure out what to do in the next 20 minutes, and uh, and we go, okay, that's fine. I'm uh, that would be delightful on many respects. I'm not predicting it. Uh, I'm not even greatly realistically wishing for it, but uh, still, if it happened, that'd be wonderful. Um, and uh, as the chairman said, you can get hold of us uh, if you're um, online through the uh, email or through Twitter. Um, and uh, of course, the, uh, you know, the chairman can ask questions whenever he wants. He does own the room. Um, uh, at the, um, so at the conclusions of the panel, we'll have time for questions, more questions questions from you or they may be coming in um, over the internet. Um, there is one important note uh, that I've been sort of asked to remind, remind both of you on the present and online audience, which is that if you submit um, uh, any questions, any information on those questions, the questions themselves go into the public record. This is still part of a formal proceeding. You know, one of the, the pleasures perhaps of being an economist is that I have no idea what any of that sort of means as a practical matter, but I've been told that it means something. So uh, so it will go into the public record in some way, shape, or form. So uh, keep that in mind. Okay. Um, let me uh, next turn to actually introducing the panelists here. Um, uh, um, I've known many of these people probably longer than some of us would care to admit. Um, since elementary school, I guess it might seem that way. Um, some of them might not want to admit to knowing me, but that's an, another matter. Um, first, I'm Tim Brennan. I'm the chief economist here. Um, the chief economist of the FCC is typically a visiting academic who may be here you know, like a year or two. Typically, I'm in the middle of a one-year appointment. Um, I'm not the director of a bureau or anything like that. I'm basically kind of here in a, sort of an advisory capacity of one um, way, shape, or form. Um, uh, now, for the rest of us, I don't think it would be possible to get a better panel than this. Let me begin with the person immediately at my left, John Levy, who's the uh, Deputy um, Chief Economist at the FCC. Um, uh, he's been here a long time. I'm not going to force him to stop me from saying how long. Um, but he's 
one of the leading media economics experts in particular that you could find, and a great example of the really high quality of economics that one can find here. It's a great one of the great pleasures of being a chief economist here is getting to work with people like John, and it's and I'm really glad that he's here to help out with this. So, turning to the panel that's been invited um, in alphabetical order. Um, first, John Baker is professor of law at um, American University's Washington College of Law. He's a former chief economist here from 2009 to 11, which means I guess he was here when the 2010 order was issued. Um, uh, he was the director of the Bureau of Economics also at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, he's been a senior economist on the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and he's one of the leading go-to people in D.C. and anywhere on antitrust law and economics issues, most recently on exclusionary conduct, but really on a whole lot of things that are uh, germane here. Um, he has a, a law degree from Harvard and a PhD in economics from Stanford, um, so I, uh, I, I certainly bow to that. Um, next is uh, Nick Economides. Um, professor of Economics at the Stern School at NYU, uh, is the director of the Networks Electronic Co Commerce and Telecommunications, or NET Institute at, uh, at NYU. If anyone could be said to have created the field of network economics as a formal matter, it would be Nick. He's the leading researcher applying economic theory to network pricing, vertical integration, net neutrality, compatibility issues. Um, I mean, he's really at the top. Uh, and to give you some indication of the prominence of his role, I was thinking about it, and I think the very first website ever, I guess, was like the CERN physicist sharing data. The second website, I think, was set up at the Cambridge Physics Department, to, a picture of the coffee pot to make sure that it was, you know, to see whether it was full or not. Someone needed to go fill it up. And I believe the third website was Nick's Economics and Networks website, um, <laughs> which is, you know, won numerous awards or been recognized as being one of the best economics websites anywhere, including on this topic, every place. So as a contributor to the profession's understanding of this issue, it would be hard to, uh, to certainly top that. And he's got a Ph.D. from Berkeley. Uh, to to uh, Nick's left, and I probably wouldn't be saying that very often, uh, uh, is... <laughs> <laughs> He's, right <in> <laughs> He's right in the middle today. That's true. Uh, that's right. Um, and it's Tom Hazlett, who's now the Hugh, Hugh H. McCauley Endowed Professor of Economics at Clemson. Came there as a, uh, from the law as a law and economics professor on the George Mason Law School faculty, I believe. Um, founded the founding director of the Information Economy, um, Economy Project there. He's also a chief econ former chief economist of the FCC. He was here from 1991 to 92. That makes two former chief economists here, and depending upon how the afternoon goes, there could be three former chief economists here. Well, um, well, we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, but he's been one of the leading writers in academic journals and also in sort of op-eds and and sort of the more sort of wider sort of business press on telecommunications issues of all sorts. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's just, you know, just to give an example, the Review of Industrial Organization, one of the leading journals in that field, had an 80th anniversary, um, or an issue commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Federal Communications Act, and the lead article was by Mr. Hazlett. Um, so uh, so it's, it's uh, great that he's here, um, and his Ph.D. is from UCLA, which he and his friends will remind us of often during football season. Um, uh, uh, next is uh, Chris Hogendorn. He's an associate professor at Wesleyan. Relative to the rest of us, he's probably the, the new kid on the telecommunications policy block, but he's done a lot of theoretical analyses of net neutrality, vertical integration, and most recently price discrimination. Um, he just sort of struck us as we were putting this panel together as someone who'd be just a really top flight contributor, and we're really happy that he came down from Wesleyan today to, uh, to join us. Um, next, John Mayo, uh, who's a professor and executive director of the Center for Business and Public Policy at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown. I've been using the term leading a lot. We've got a great panel here. Um, I'd say John is probably... The, among the leading, if not the leading, sort of re researcher into the empirical effects of telecommunications 
regulations and policies on marketplaces, prices, consumers, businesses, whatever it might be. Um, uh, stuff has been, it's been on the reading list for this sort of thing for a long, long time. Um, and uh, it's just a great perspective to have. And he has other great thoughts on sort of the regulatory process generally, and I'm sure we're going to be getting to those today. So thanks a lot, John, for coming. Um, last and by no means least, Hal Singer. Um, he's a, uh, a principal at Economist Incorporated, which is in some sense the founding uh, antitrust-specific consulting firm started by some of my former colleagues at the antitrust division a long time ago. Um, uh, he's a senior fellow at the Progressive Policy Institute, which is one of our top policy think tanks in town, familiar to many of you, I'm, I think. An uh, adjunct professor at McDonough School of Business, written a couple of books on, on telecommunications policy, numerous articles, lots of consulting gigs, um, PhDs from Johns Hopkins. So, uh, so as I said, I don't think we could do better than this. Now, before we get to the opening statements, I guess I've got one of my own. Uh, the first is... Whenever I speak in public, I'm supposed to issue a disclaimer, and I'll issue it again here, which is that any opinions or views I express are not those of the FCC, the chairman, or any of its commissioners. And I think that's a particularly important disclaimer to make here, um, because my role here is to ask people a lot of questions on one sort of things, to try to bring out assumptions, evidence, why do you think that, why do you think that, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, you know, I can't claim to be as, as sort of as, as opaque as Supreme Court justices reportedly are about that sort of thing. But um, you shouldn't try to infer from what I'm, uh, from the questions I ask, what I may happen to think about things. And even if one could, uh, that doesn't really represent the views of anybody else here. So one should uh, take all those things with great, um, uh, with great uh, caution and probably shouldn't make any inferences at all. And it's not my role to be that sort of representative. The, per the chief economist is brought in as a visiting academic as opposed to being a continuing staff person, sometimes just to be in some sense the outsider. Uh, so, um, and that's been true of the people here who've been chief economists and, and the people who've come before and after me. Now, and I said, this is especially important for these questions I'll be asking. Some of these may be way outside the box. If I happen to say because of something somebody says, well, gee, why don't we try this? I don't want anyone to write down and say, FCC thinks we should try this. That would, no, that would not be right. It's something that's sort of thrown out there as a way, again, to try to sort of prompt discussion. Um, so they're not necessarily things that should be taken seriously in that regard. Um, that's, I do want to thank a lot of people um, in, in who've helped me with coming up with the questions here. John, um, uh, Bill Sharkey, and Mark Bykowski, people sitting out in the, in the, uh, um, in the audience, um, some economists in the, in the Office of Strategic um, Planning who've thought a lot, about this, a lot about this issue, um, and others at the FCC as well. And I think we've even gotten some outside questions before this came, which, which, which I've been using to, uh, to help um, uh, frame things a little bit. Now, in terms of what I want to do today, in, in one of his er earlier um, introductions to one of these panels, uh, the chairman said that he wanted to add, uh, you know, light, not heat, to the discussion of these open internet, open internet issues. I totally agree with that, and I want to sort of put my own kind of spin on that a little bit, which is I want to add think about this as a light, not heat. Think of this as nuance rather than passion. There's often two sorts of views out there. One is that we are witnessing the apocalyptic demise of the Internet. And the other is encapsulated by a joke, which is how many economists does it take to change a light bulb? If you've never heard the joke, the answer is none. The market will take care of it. Uh, so you've got these kinds of extremes on either side when, in fact, and this may seem simple to a lot of people. It doesn't seem simple to me. It hasn't seemed simple to me in the time I've spent here learning about it, that it's a complicated interaction of complexities in law, in engineering, delivery, interconnection, the last mile, content development, consumer preference, and who knows what other things. And those things lead to the economic complexities, I think, in the economics of how to think about this stuff. Um, it's hard, at least for me, to be stridently confident about one view or the other when there's all these moving parts around. So for me, if a takeaway from all of this is that people 
on all sides of the issue say to themselves, you know, I think I still believe this, but maybe this is a little more complicated than I thought. Maybe I need to think about it a little more than I think will have accomplished something, I would think will have accomplished something vitally important. Now, one other thing I, I need to, uh, to say, which is uh, in, in putting this panel together, you get sort of, sorts of volunteers and people asking about how the panel gets constructed. And one of the things about this is that this is a largely academic panel. And maybe I should explain why it's a largely academic panel, because I think that that's important. Oh, I should mention, thank you, uh, Commissioner Rosenwurzel has, has joined us as well. Over oh, and Commissioner O'Reilly, too. Thanks a lot for coming. Commissioner Rosenwurzel. Rosenwurzel, yeah. Hi. <laughs> uh, um, they, too, can ask questions whenever they want. Uh, the uh, um, is uh, when you have a PhD in economics and you sort of hang out with normal people, one of the things that you get is they'll ask things like, what stock should I buy? I have no idea what stock you should buy. And in some sense, that's not, what, that's not my job as an economist. My job as an economist is to figure out whether there's any market failures of significance and what we might do about them. So, so person, you know, people, businesses, entrepreneurs, innovators, workers, whatever, that they can figure out what the price of things ought to be, what should be offered, what qualities of things should be offered, and so on. That's what ought to be out there. It's, the thing is not something that's sort of foreordained. It's like, can we fix the system so then if the system has a problem, the system have a problem, if it does, what can we do about it to make it work better? Um, and the academic prospect, perspective, I think, is really ha important with that, starting from first principles and then looking at remedies, which is why I've structured the questions the way I, way I have. Um, last, I guess, uh, is, well, just to be clear also, this is, even though I kind of come at things from a theoretical point of view, facts are extraordinarily important that should be coming out here today as well, at least what we need to know in case we don't know it up here. In terms of how this works, I've told this to all the panels. Um, uh, I'm hoping for a discussion, not a debate. Many of the panels here are, are experienced experts in litigation. This is not litigation. At least I'm hoping it's not litigation. The point of this is not to, uh, you know, score points on the others or whatever, but to say, well, that's interesting, and, and it's kind of move from there. The metaphor I've had for this is, is kind of being in grad school sitting around, and it's kind of like hashing out the issue. Now, for some of this, grad school is a more recent experience than others. Every so often I consult my papyrus notes <laughs> to uh, refresh my memory on some things I learned in grad school. Um, when I think of the grad school metaphor, as I've mentioned to people, it's often when you sit around and try to thrash these issues out when you're in grad school, you're often doing it over a couple of pictures of beer. Unfortunately, there's no beer here today. So, um, so, but it's that kind of engagement that I'd like to see. You know, John and I have a bunch of questions that we can uh, throw out there, but to the extent that this, that, that in some sense the panelists take it over, that's great. So, on to the statements. Um, to give us a chance to learn things and to set the stage for questions to come. Uh, a way to focus this is to kind of get to the big picture is to say, you know, does the local broadband access market succeed or fail in providing content to, co to consumers? What assumptions are important in justifying that? What evidence is important? And so with that as a framer, let me turn over to John, thanking everybody again and thanking all of you again for coming. John, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Tim and, and John, for inviting me and for Tim's generous introduction. Uh, it's great to be back here at the FCC. Uh, as Tim said, I worked on the 2010 uh, inter Open Internet Order, uh, and I also ought to disclose that I have, I'm not working on the current rulemaking for any interested party, although I am uh, working now for various communications industry participants on other matters, some in front of this agency. Uh, I want to sketch my view of the, the economic problem that we're concerned with. Uh, and the key concern is to reduce the risk that the uh, virtuous circle of innovation will slow or break if broadband providers block or degrade access to edge providers offering content applications or services, or if broadband providers charge ed pro edge providers high prices. And there's a particular concern to avoid chilling experimentation by emerging garage entrepreneurs on the edge. Broadband providers might 
engage in at least three types of harmful practices that we ought to be concerned with uh, more specifically. The first is exclusion or raising rivals costs. A broadband provider might have an incentive to uh, block or disadvantage edge providers that compete with its own current or future uh, planned offerings or to accept payment from some edge providers to block or disadvantage those edge providers' competitors. The second uh, uh, type of problem is the terminating monopoly or gatekeeper uh, problem. If broadband providers can charge edge providers uh, for priority access to end users, they may have an incentive to exploit their gatekeeper position to impose excessive charges, uh, regardless of whether the broadband providers can exercise market power with respect to uh, end users. And the third uh, uh, type of problem is uh, managing, is, uh, is, the, is the danger of uh, manipulation of uh, service quality. A broadband provider might have an incentive to, de to uh, degrade or decline to uh, increase the quality of service provided to non-prioritized traffic uh, as by declining to expand capacity in order to exploit its terminating monopoly more effectively. And with, so with that introduction to the, to the, the problems, I want to say also explain why I think uh, briefly why uh, ex-ante rules uh, are needed. Uh, uh, broadband provider incentives to block or discriminate against edge providers have been increasing. Uh, with the growth of uh, edge providers like Netflix and YouTube that compete with broadband provider offerings and with increased interest by broadband providers in offering edge services. And the th threat of antitrust enforcement uh, will not fully deter the harms. Antitrust faces difficult problems of proof when the uh, consumer harm arises from lost potential competition, uh, as by chilling edge providers who are not yet a success or, or have not yet uh, been imagined. And the antitrust cannot easily address terminating monopoly harms because there may be no practical antitrust remedy. Uh, rules have two uh, types of benefits that are important compared with case-by-case -case enforcement. They can prevent harms to innovation, investment, and competition that may be irreversible or very costly to undo. And they can reduce broadband and edge provider uncertainty. And finally, costs uh, imposed by FCC rules that are similar to those promulgated in 2010 are likely to be small uh, for three reasons. The first is all the, all, those 20, all the 2010 rules were in place for more than two years and they continue to apply to uh, uh, one large broadband provider uh, under an order without any obvious harm. Second, the theoretical possibility that of discouraging uh, broadband provider network investments uh, does not seem to be a major concern in practice, given that past broadband provider investments have not been predicated on, on an expectation of charging edge providers for priority access to edge users and given the small revenue impact of recent broadband provider ch charges for transit and uh, uh, content delivery network uh, co-location. And, and third, the, the rules that allow reasonable network uh, management are presumably going to permit cost-based congestion pricing, and if so, they would not deny broadband providers the resulting uh, efficiency benefits. So when I look at, at this uh, sketch of uh, benefits and costs, I conclude that rules like those that were proposed in 2010 would pass any sensible cost-benefit test, even with uh, reasonable extensions to address the, the growth of mobile data usage or concerns about interconnection that have become a little more prominent since 2010. And with that, I think I'll thank you and uh, look forward to hearing my colleagues. Great, John. Thanks a lot. Um, Nick, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, th let me start by saying uh, I also do not work for any party in this proceeding, and uh, uh, I like uh, what uh, Professor Baker said, and I do not find anything, actually, that I disagree with, which is great. Um, let me start um, my remarks. Um, the Internet has been extremely successful and uh, we now have uh, over a billion nodes of coverage, and there has been tremendous innovation at the edge of the network. It has made information available for free or at very low cost. It allowed for digital goods distribution and electronic commerce. It allowed the creation of digital communities, uh, digital social networks, digital game networks. It allowed for extremely cheap telephone and video communications over the Internet. So there have been huge benefits 
to American consumers and worldwide uh, from the existence of the Internet. U.S. consumers pay relatively high prices for access and uh, penetration lags compared to other countries, and that's a problem. Um, and in my opinion, the fact that the major uh, providers, telephone and um, cable companies, have a different primary business, video or telephone, and not Internet provision as a primary business, is, is an issue. Um, residential ISPs think that they do not get paid enough uh, by users in the present regime of network neutrality, and the ISPs have asked to be compensated by senders, that is, content and application providers. Uh, content and application providers pay their ISPs um, through, through the, and their ISPs pay their backbone for access, but now they're asked to pay over and above that directly to residential ISPs. So who is asked to pay more? Uh, big companies such as uh, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, uh, but also publishers like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, but also nonprofits such as New York University, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, UC Berkeley, and practically anybody who places content online. Specifically, the ISPs really want to sell customers, their customers, to the, to the, to the senders. So how would this normally be taken care of? Normally it would be taken care of by competition. But competition is limited uh, since ISPs have market power and there is the terminating monopoly issue that uh, Jonathan um, uh, described. And it is, I think, remarkable that all major ISPs have made the same demand to kill network neutrality. And there are, of course, additional anti-competitive concerns, the fact that residential and mobile ISPs are, in fact, competing with companies that provide phone services such as Skype or streaming video Netflix over the, over the Internet. So what is the proposal of the ISPs? It's essentially uh, having... Um, payments for prioritizing services. Paid prioritization is a way to segment the market and increase revenue to the seller. Prioritization creates artificial scarcity. Not natural scarcity that exists anyway, but artificial scarcity. Creates new uncertainty that forces users to make decisions under uncertainty. Users would not know when a page doesn't load quickly or doesn't load at all, whether the ISP created a delay uh, or the sender, and would typically, I think, blame the sender. The ISP could take advantage of the artificial scarcity to extract surplus money from, from senders. To be able to make money, the ISP has to create a difference in the delivery time between the packets of those who pay and the packets of those who do not pay. If the ISP cannot make the information packets go faster, than before prioritization in the present status quo, it is likely to try to force a delay on information packets of non-payers to degrade service compared to the status quo. Prioritization gives the ISP the ability to determine winners in each of the product services markets like search, movie downloads, etc., that get transported over the Internet. And it will reduce innovation at the edge of the network. In contrast with telecom and cable companies, the FCC is the guardian of the public interest. Uh, there are parties in this issue that are not represented here, future innovators, future consumers. The FCC should look beyond the profits of the ISPs to the benefits of consumers and the benefits of present and future senders, content and application providers, and the impact of policies on innovation. In my opinion, the public interest is served best if the FCC imposes strict net neutrality rules that do not allow for payment for prioritization, imposing rules that only ban unreasonable discrimination as the 2010 ones will not be sufficient to guard for the public interest. It would rather involve pay endless proceedings to determine what is reasonable. Network neutrality also, in my opinion, should be applied across the board, both in fixed and wireless uh, telecommunications internet telecommunic broadband telecommunications. Uh, regulations should include transparency, both to the users as, to, as well as to the senders, and transparency towards the senders should be more 
technically oriented since the centers are most likely more technically oriented. Regulations should not include uh, commercially reasonable um, considerations. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm informed by legal experts that the FCC has sufficient authority to ban paid prioritization. Let me close by underlining that I do not usually advocate regulation, but since competition is very unlikely to fix this problem, the FCC should intervene by imposing strict network neutrality rules. Thank you very much. Nick, uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, Tom. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Tim, and, and uh, I do thank the FCC for holding the hearing and inviting me uh, to participate. And uh, uh, like our previous speakers, I don't have any uh, uh, involvement in the matter uh, other than as an uh, interested economist watching uh, the FCC. Um, and I think uh, our first two economists have teed things up well. Um, and uh, I'm just going to sort of jump in where, 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 they, where they teed things up and take it from a slightly different perspective. Um, as a business matter, uh, the network of networks is coordinated by contracts between complementary suppliers, and terms and conditions differ substantially from deal to deal. So network traffic is routinely managed. Certain uses of an ISP's network band, unauthorized devices excluded. Uh, just read your service agreement for any ISP, particularly go to the small ISPs, those uh, presumably without any market power, uh, or the rules uh, issued by university IT departments, uh, see how they behave, no profit motive at all, and they're going to have network management involved in what they do. So in general, the FCC does not want to police every deal. That, that certainly is clear, and it's clear when the FCC did put out rules in 2010, there was a, a carve-out in network neutrality enforcement for reasonable network management. And, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, reasonable is determined in the devil's playground here in Washington, and that gave lots of parties cause for concern or cause for joy, depending upon uh, <laughs> where they got their law degree. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the idea of uh, network neutrality regulation, uh, as, as put forward here, is that regulators cannot <clears throat> spy anti-competitive extractions case by case and then move to zap those extractions. Rather, certain types of charges and forms of vertical integration are inherently suspicious and should be excluded by, by rule. Then there will be a case-by-case -case analysis, presumably, to, to determine what uh, certain practices uh, in this categorically suspicious category will be allowed back in for reasonable network management. So we come to this classic uh, argument, and it's important, and the FCC is grappling with it. Where should the burden of proof lie? Antitrust law, which does govern uh, certainly all the Internet practices mentioned, it's been mentioned here on the panel, um, the, uh, the antitrust laws do outlaw vertical foreclosure, and that's the essential problem seen here and discussed so far. Uh, antitrust, however, views the market in general as endemically efficient and then attempts to identify uniquely inefficient practice practices to remedy. So that's the existing policy. And I should say, under this policy, the open Internet has developed. And uh, certainly the chairman is exactly right. There is no law. There is no law today to protect the open Internet other than antitrust law. That's the existing policy, giving categorical acceptance to these business transactions that uh, are heterogeneous and differ case by case. And then under existing law, certainly, there is a case-by-case -case methodology under law to find anti-competitive violations. Uh, and, and there have been some. Uh, uh, the, I, I just will throw out uh, uh, Professor Economides' favorite case, the Microsoft case, uh, uh, attempted to do this. Uh, network neutrality switches that presumption, and uh, it, it starts with, in essence, a categorical ban on non-neutral uh, uh, business arrangements in the Internet space, and then we'll go case by case to find efficient exceptions. Now, uh, I have a strong opinion on that policy, and I think it's best to uh, assume uh, the efficiency is endemic uh, in the Internet, that these deals, uh, non-neutral deals engaged in by ISPs, 
and by, in, in many cases, collaboration with edge providers, uh, are efficient, but we, we come to a, uh, a research program uh, to examine two basic questions. Uh, so this is for everybody who, no matter what side they're on. First, uh, are non-neutral contracts generally efficient? Let's look at those contracts and, and sort of take, take, take their measure. Secondly, as a policy matter, has broadband regulation or deregulation produced identifiable results? And this has been touched on, but there actually is some evidence on this. And uh, uh, I'm out of time, so I will just uh, leave you with what I think are uh, two, uh, uh, excuse me, three papers worth reading. First of all, Jason Oxman's 1999 paper, The FCC and the Unregulation of the Internet, is certainly worth reading and understanding in terms of uh, how these markets have developed uh, uh, by excluding them from neutrality regulation, particularly Title II regulation. Uh, I would also recommend a 2008 article by uh, uh, Thomas Hazlett and Anil Kaliskan, Natural Experiments in Broadband Regulation. It turns out that uh, you, we can tell from looking at the broadband market that open access rules, which are similar to net neutrality rules, uh, have, have uh, actually deterred deployment of broadband technology, and deregulation has encouraged them. And uh, lastly, uh, I wrote a paper with um, uh, now Commissioner, Federal Trade Commissioner, uh, uh, Josh Wright in 2012, uh, Indiana Law Review, the law and economics of uh, network neutrality regulation. And uh, I think that uh, those papers are very, very well written uh, <laughs> and a testimony to my ability to pick excellent co-authors. So I leave you with those. Thank you, and I'm sorry for exceeding the time here. Okay, Tom, thanks a lot. Chris, please. Well, thanks so much for having me here. Um, I've been thinking um, about the idea of the open Internet for many years, and I think that when people use that term, they're thinking about certain values that come from the Internet, and I've been trying to put some structure from the field of economics on what those values are. And I've focused on the idea of spillovers, that there are values that go beyond just the individual transaction uh, between a content provider, an ISP, and a consumer, um, where there are other benefits out there, and they may not accrue to those who are involved in, in that transaction. Um, I think there are three reasons these are large with respect to the Internet. One, it's a general purpose technology. It's used for a very wide range and variety of uses across the entire economy. Uh, two, there are network effects involved in the Internet, and so a lot of the types of services that are provided have a communications element. Um, people get more value out of a service like, say, Facebook if there are more people using it, and those people are spread out all over the Internet. They're not just on one ISP. Um, and third, it's an innovation spawning infrastructure, and that means that over time, uh, there are lots of new products and new technologies that are supported by the Internet, um, but those are future uses, and the uh, beneficiaries of those are not necessarily present when any particular commercial transaction takes place in the present. So if you follow that line of thinking that it's about spillover benefits, sometimes economists speak of these as externalities. There's some subtleties there, but uh, they're fairly similar. Um, there's two really important conclusions from economic theory, and I'd like to put them on the table. The first is, because the beneficiaries are not party to the transaction, Competition is not a solution to these problems. It makes no difference. In fact, it can make things worse if there's more competition. At least a large ISP might have an incentive to internalize some of these benefits. Um, smaller ISPs don't. So I think that there's a lot of confusion about the benefits of competition. There are many benefits of competition, not with regard to spillovers, not with regard to what I think a lot of people are talking about when they speak of openness and speak of that as having public value. 
the second thing is that when one speaks of spillovers what matters in any kind of change in the in the transactional environment is what part of the spillovers are appropriate and any benefits that aren't appropriate as part of an economic transaction simply aren't represented and yet they may be large so let me just give an example um, one of zillion examples that could come from the internet suppose a consumer watches a video uh, about medical care um, you know maybe managing diabetes let's say uh, maybe they see this on a provider like webmd everything that we're talking about concerns whether or not maybe the isp might be able to sort of cut some kind of deal with webmd that would have something to do with the advertising revenues on webmd or or maybe a subscription service that the consumer might subscribe to but those are the appropriate benefits but how about the consumer's potential better health that's not going to be included in that transaction how about the benefit to the employer who now has a employee who's not absent as much that's really pretty much impossible to appropriate when you're talking about an ISP content provider transaction um how about the benefit to the government that might have lower healthcare expenditures because of this I mean they're really not represented in that kind of a transaction so i really want to put on the table that i think a lot of the benefits that people are speaking of are external or spillover from the types of transactions that we're talking about here today and that that's a very very important consideration going forward in this role making process chris thanks a lot uh, john <clears throat> thank you very much uh commissioner wheeler commissioner rosenworcel Commissioner Riley, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted that you're here. Tim, thank you. Thanks to Jonathan. I know we are in for a very rich, detailed, specific discussion of how the economics discipline can inform decision making on how to preserve and promote the open internet. Uh and I'm looking forward to that specific detailed discussion. But what I want to do it in my opening remarks is is to step back just a bit and to offer what i hope to be some stage setting remarks and and a framework an economic framework that i hope will be useful i think when matters get complicated i have found that sometimes the very best thing you can do is to is to go back to basic principles and find out what you really know works so what i'd like to do is is to offer a basic set of principles now i'm a regulatory economist i have been for 30 years i've been looking at how um regulation affects economic outcomes for a long time now and what i've seen in that time that i've been studying it is all too often the decision making process in regulation is affected by let's just call it the ideological mood of the moment the american people are in an ideological mood to have a less activist government and a wave of deregulation sweeps the economy across all sectors more or less independent of the economic benefits of the specific deregulatory process in a specific industry or alternatively a wave of regulation and re-regulation and turning up the regulatory dial is likely to follow the ideological mood of the american people if they prefer a more activist government but ideology is not a particularly good driver of economic outcomes uh, there is a better way to do it and i th think as i started to think of how there might be a better way to do it i thought how might we bring the very best regulatory structure in the 21st century forward from the 20th century so what i have done over the last couple of years is to look backwards to ask if we comb the regulatory literature for the last 50 years and regulatory decision making over the last 50 years what are the very best common characteristics what are the common characteristics of the very best regulatory decisions that have been made and it turns out there are a set of common characteristics a set of common principles if you will that i think we can draw upon 
And what I want to do briefly is just simply, in the time that remains for my opening remarks, is to lay these out on the table, and I think we'll have the opportunity to maybe discuss how these play out in the specific instance that we're dealing with today uh, over the course of the afternoon. So I'll try to list these briefly. Number one, it, I think it will serve all parties well, uh, the private sector, regulators, NGOs, and so on, to remember principle number one. Principle number one is that all governance mechanisms, all governance mechanisms are in practice imperfect. All governance mechanisms in practice are imperfect. That means regulation is imperfect. It means markets are imperfect. We just simply don't have the choice of throwing perfect and costly regulation, costless regulation at an imperfect market. Nor can we avoid costly regulation by rather naive appeals on an ideological basis to perfect markets. The choice is not between perfect regulation or perfect markets. It's between imperfect regulation and imperfect markets. The choice is not going to be in this case or any other case about ideology. It needs to be about practicality, principle number one. Principle number two, regulators must smartly evolve regulation with changes in technology and changes in other economic institutions. Regulations are put in place at a moment in time and with a particular set of economic institutions that are in place, but both technology and economic institutions evolve. The very best policies, regulatory decisions that have been made in the 20th century evolved those policies as a result of evolving technology and evolving economic institutions. The thing, that principle is like to be, likely to be accelerated in a world of the digital economy today. Principle number three, regulators should benchmark and experiment relentlessly. The very best regulatory decisions of the 20th century involved a significant amount of benchmarking and a significant amount of experimentation. This was true in many of the success stories of the regulatory process of the 20th century. Just to point to a, a, a few, the, the process of deregulating the rail industry, the airline industry, the trucking industry, which all enjoyed bipartisan support, the process of deregulating the long-distance telecommunications industry, again, very much a bipartisan effort that all rested on that all rested on um, evidence and experiment and uh, experimentation and benchmarking. Similarly, the decisions that that re-regulated or increased regulation in the 20th century that were successful did so on the basis of experimentation and on benchmarking. Fourth principle: Regulators should place a very heavy weight on empirical on empirical analysis rather than abstract theory. Now, I'm an economist, I'm on an economics panel, I'm not ready to disavow my discipline, but I think in this world where, um, where the world is changing very, very rapidly, empirical evidence is likely to be a better lens than a pure theoretical lens. Theoretical conjecture, I think, is going to be a poor substitute as we move forward uh, for hard empirical evidence. Finally. Fifth principle, regulators, I believe, should focus, focus, should focus on in-state retail economic metrics. Those uh, are to, uh, to, that is to say that metrics like price, output, innovation, quality uh, are important to retail consumers, and, and I think there's a great deal to be learned from them. I'm over time, so I'll stop there. Okay. Thank, thanks a lot, John. Uh, Hal, please. Thanks, and I'd like to thank the Commission for including me on this esteemed panel. Uh, given my experience in working uh, for independent cable networks in several discrimination complaints before the FCC, I hope to bring a fresh perspective on how the FCC should address discrimination by ISPs against independent content providers. I'd like to make five uh, simple points in favor of a case-by-case -case approach to adjudicating discrimination complaints on the Internet. First, economists and engineers who have studied the issue of priority service unanimously believe that a market for priority could 
be a good thing for all parties to the transaction, including broadband customers. While priority arrangements could be used by an ISP for bad reasons, like favoring its own content or an exclusive app provider, priority could also be used for good reasons. The packets associated with a life-saving telemedicine application demand better treatment than the packets associated with a video of a cat unwinding a ball of yarn. Both the app provider and the customer benefit because the app, because the customer gets to experience the real-time app in all of its glory. And the ISP finds a new source of revenue. It's a win-win-win. This is why we don't want to ban all priority deals. We just want to eliminate the harmful ones. And that argues for a case-by-case -case approach over a blanket prohibition. Second, not only do all parties to the priority transaction benefit, no third party is worse off with priority. Net neutrality proponents counter that an upstart app provider that can't afford the upgrade is worse off. But that is only the case if the ISP degrades the connection of the app providers who decline priority. If the ISPs were to keep whole those apps that decline priority, then there is no impairment in any meaningful sense. This is why we need to distinguish between what I call no slow lanes and no fast lanes. The former would ban ISPs from degrading service from those who decline priority, while the latter would prevent ISPs from offering any priority. Proponents of strong net neutrality claim that without a shred of evidence, by the way, that the mere thought of a priority deal occurring would cause fragile upstarts to shutter their business plans. Third, the leading proponent of strong net neutrality acknowledged in the first uh, FCC roundtable two weeks ago that priority could be a good thing so long as it is user-directed and users pick up the tab. This was a brave admission, and it opens up the door to a breakthrough compromise. Users served by two or more ISPs already have an implicit say on harmful priority deals uh, by voting with their feet. But to make their say explicit, we can involve end users in crafting priority arrangements. As soon as one acknowledges that priority could benefit broadband customers under certain uh, situations, the claim that all priority should be banned evaporates. Now, with respect to the suggestion that only users should pay for priority delivery, this is blatant protectionism for certain content providers. No economic model would ever require the more price-sensitive party to pick up the full tab of the service. Now, while the model of uh, Dr. Economides solved for the conditions under which a user pays restriction generates benefits for content providers in excess of consumer harm, it turns out that those conditions likely are not satisfied in the real world. And in any event, a user pay restriction harms users under any parameterization of his model. Fourth, even if the FCC wanted to ban priority outright, there is no guarantee that Title II is up for the task. Trying to ban priority under Section 706 is what got the FCC's 2010 order vacated by the D.C. Circuit, and I'll quote, if the Commission will likely bar broadband providers from charging ed pro edge providers for using the service, thus forcing them to sell the service to all who ask at a price of zero, we see no room at all for individualized bargaining, end quote. Net neutrality proponents are advising Chairman Wheeler that if he wants to ban all forms of priority, he would be better off using Title II. But even advocates of common carriage concede that Title II would permit priority arrangements. Their only hope of banning priority under Title II is to get the Commission to declare all priority uh, to be inherently unjust, as it did with certain conduct in Carter Phone and Computer II. But the conduct in those cases is far removed from merely offering priority um, to third parties, and the competitive circumstances are entirely different. The FCC can evade this trap by permitting priority and policing it on a case-by-case -case basis. Fifth, my final point, the critiques of case-by-case -case should not persuade the Commission to embrace a blanket prohibition on priority. Now, as the economic expert in several discrimination complaints brought against cable operators uh, at the FCC, let me be the first to admit that the FCC's adjudication process could use some tweaks. 
It takes too long, it can be expensive for upstarts, and it fails to provide relief even after the plaintiff prevails on an administrative law, uh, law judge and a majority of the commissioners that discrimination has occurred. But the commission is starting from a blank slate here and can address these challenges when it designs the ground rules. The costs associated with using a case-by-case -case approach, even an imperfect process, pale in comparison to the cost that would be inflicted on the Internet ecosystem if, a slow, if an investment slowdown occurred when we embrace common carriage. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Hal, and thanks to everybody. Um, Nick, I'm going to give you a chance to respond later. Uh, <laughs> however, because I want to, because I want, I want to come back to, to what I'm going to call, for lack of a better term, the two-sided pricing issue, um, uh, which has been raised by by many. Um, the issue I, I want to get to first, though, is something that that, that Nick and others raise, and, and and I think has, at least from from my view of the discussion, his his seem to be what this what a lot of the debate has come to be about, which is this paid prioritization stuff, a lot of what, what Hal was talking about, but others have raised it as well. And what would help me a lot in understanding this is um, is is the nature of the case against it in the following sense. Um, let's leave aside Perhaps empirically, this is incorrect, but let's leave aside the possibility that that if you gave someone with market power the ability to differentiate, that they're going to fool around, that their incentives to degrade, and so on. So let's say that there's that you don't have that. Um, uh, again, I'm not saying that that you know we can discuss, we can and should, and will discuss later on whether that that is the case. But that's but but basically, what I want to know is. Um, Suppose that however it came to be, whether you believe that the market's competitive, holding, again, just as an assumption for now, perhaps, um, or whatever, that, that suppose that, that you can offer you know, this quality of service at this price, which is basically essentially a cost-based price, whether enforced by competition or some other means. And you can have a higher level of service quality at a higher price. And some people opt for one, same people opt for another. Assuming that those are cost-based prices, should that be banned, or is the case against paid prioritization based upon either a degradation threat or what in current antitrust parlance has come to be called contracts that reference rivals, in other words, that that the prioritization I buy isn't high quality service, but I want to make sure I get better service than you, that kind of thing. So is there a case against paid prioritization in some sense when it's free of free of obvious problems? In other words, would would people just be is it just I mean, why are people against it? Is it because you don't think you're going to get cost based prices or is it because there's something that's inherently anti-competitive or a barrier to entry that you, it, an argument the one hears quite a bit, as Hal pointed out, that somehow this just, it's just anti-competitive to say that, that if, if an incumbent buys some service at a high quality, that that's inappropriate, that an entrant would have to pay a higher price for that same quality. Please. I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but let me just try to take a stab at answering. Uh, sure. Uh, the I didn't. What I didn't hear uh, was uh, the terminating monopoly and the ex uh, danger of exclusionary conduct. It, 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 I think maybe that's what you are perhaps loading into your when you say, "Well, you were afraid the prices won't be related to costs," and I think that's right. The prices won't be related to costs because the the if we're, if we're if we're talking, I guess I'm assuming we're talking about prices charged to edge providers as yes. for this purpose rather than prices charged to end users. That's right. And the prices charged to edge providers, uh, the the uh, the broadband provider would have a incentive to raise prices to levels that are unrelated to cost in your language right? Uh, because it is the only way in which uh, uh, because once 
the end user has signed up for that broadband provider. There's no other way to reach that end user. Right. And because, which is the gatekeeper of terminating monopoly problem, right. and because the broadband provider has incentives to uh, exclude uh, in order to benefit its own um, uh, edge activities or be perhaps because it's paid by some other edge provider to do so. And, unless you, and if you're ruling that all that out by assumption and we only have cost-based pricing, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that maybe we have you know some good things that could happen with congestion pricing uh, mm -hmm. in 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 encouraging efficiency, uh, and we would all and we, uh, but even but uh, and then I'm not also I'm also not sure in your question whether you're allowing out or allowing in price discrimination um, uh, for for non anti competitive kind of reasons. Uh, you know, well, I'm sorry, right? That, that, you know, the uh, but but price discrimination uh, you know could be. Harmful and it could be beneficial. To, you know, looking at it sort of, uh, you know, on its own. But the big answer, the main answer to your question, mm -hmm. is I don't ex have any expectation that the prices would always be cost-based. And the the concern is the that because of the terminating monopoly and the incentives to exclude, they won't be. No, that's fair. That's and that that'll harm innovation yeah. and every and right. consumers. Right. No, I, I, underst I understand. I understand that. I think the um, perhaps to clarify my question, what I was trying to sort of get at was you know, how raised this a little bit is that there is an argument that is out there that that priority pricing is inherently bad without the nuance. In other words, that it's that it is just an inherent barrier to entry that is something that something is somehow unfair or inappropriate for incumbents to get a better deal than entrance, leaving aside Terminating monopoly, leaving aside, you know, in, incentives to discriminate in favor of vertical, vertically affiliated services, um, that sort of thing. So I just want to make sure that that if there's an argument against paid prioritization, that's an argument based upon a failure of competition in providing prioritization or something like that, as opposed to an argument against prioritization ipso facto. Well, I mean, if prioritization is used to create artificial scarcity. Mm -hmm. And the the reason why a company might have the ability to do so already, uh, Jonathan mentioned this is a terminating monopoly problem. Right. But once you give a company the ability to do um, to create artificial scarcity by saying these guys are prioritized, these guys are not prioritized, mm -hmm. and only those who pay me something or whatever that amount uh, get get to be prioritized then the company is going to do it. I mean, obviously, I mean, there are incentives, and, and the people who run these companies are not idiots. I mean, they right. understand that they're going to make more money by creating the artificial scarcity, and scarcity is the world on which the whole economy works. Right. So if I can make artificial scarcity towards whoever, the upstream guys, the downstream guys, whoever, mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. Uh, it the, now, there might be some obscure example in which this might be good, but then there would be, if you adopt in principle that it's okay, then you're going to have hundreds and hundreds of cases, people coming in and saying, well, but look, I mean, my artificial scarcity is not really justified by any um, uh, economic, uh, economically reasonable uh, reason. Plus, you have the additional issue of the spillovers that Christian mentioned, and I mentioned the fact that there are unnamed parties. Mm -hmm. There are people who are not able to come to you today and say, look, I have been harmed because these guys are in the future. I mean, but I think at the same time, the responsibility of the commission is to deal with those as well, to mm -hmm. take into account their benefits and the benefits of uh, the, the future of uh, participants in the U.S. economy. John, please. Tim, to get at your, your question, I, I think at the most basic economic level, I think we would all be in agreement, actually. And the agreement is that offering consumers that are heterogeneous consumers, that is to say <clears throat> consumers that have different preferences, different levels well, think of... think of these as being offered to service providers, so not, not end users. No, I understand, I okay. understand but, but in that sense, they are, are consumers as well, right? right? Okay. So offering different levels of quality to people, parties, companies that, that have different preferences is a way of promoting, not retarding, economic welfare in general, in general. Now, we can then talk about artificial scarcity, and that then becomes a different issue because if 
offering different prices at different qualities results in anti-competitive degradation of either output or quality, that's when presumably there is a role for public policy. And my understanding is both the antitrust laws of this country and uh, the authority under the Telecommunications Act in both section, in section 706 would allow for a public policy process that would halt harmful reductions in output. Okay. Anybody want to, how anybody want to chime in on this? How, go ahead. Answer the question, uh, is, is there anything wrong in the abstract with an offer being put in the marketplace that says, uh, that's available to all comers at the same terms as if, if you take this priority, your packets for your real-time application, whether it's a telemedicine application or an online gaming app application, will be available. Um, is the, do an, does an economist have, an, have a problem uh, with such an offer? I think the answer is no. The, the, it, 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 it could be made into something nefarious depending on what the, what the default rule is, and that's why I keep coming back to my no slow lanes. If, if you are penalized for saying no, that is, if, if you experience a degradation, an absolute degradation in the quality of your service, then, then I would want the FCC to stop that. Right, mm -hmm. but if you are left whole, if if nothing if nothing is worse as a result, right? We talked about Nick's. Nick has a website uh, for uh, the Network of Economics. I've got a website for my blog. Right? Mm -hmm. If if uh, if an ISP were to put out an offer for presumably real time applications, all comers could take this. Right? Nick and I would probably turn it down. Right? And and none of our none of our users who come to our websites uh, would would uh, experience any degradation or would even know that that we turned it down. Right? So that the, the notion that it's available uh, to all comers and the default rule uh, preserves the same quality of service if you say no mm -hmm. is something that I think should be palatable to most economists. Well, back yeah, because I don't think we could, I, we, there's a line here. It's a, Chris yeah, first, then, just, then I mean, Tom, then Nick. I mean, I, I want to slightly disagree with the idea that, that an economist would never be against, uh, uh, you know, putting an offer out there. There, there would be there would be cases. You talked about cost-based pricing. And you didn't actually say marginal cost. I don't know if that was on purpose or not. I just didn't want to get too technical about it. That's well, but I think it makes a big difference, yeah. right? If um, <clears throat> there's a case yeah. for below marginal cost pricing of some things that I think economists would agree with, school lunch programs, right? Mm -hmm. You price it below marginal cost because you think there's positive externalities. So, you know, that's fine. I, I mean, I think, I think we have models of that. Um, you want to be careful with that kind of thing. You want to have a pretty clear idea that there really is a positive externality there if you're going to get it into below marginal cost pricing. Now, if you're just talking about cost-based, if you're talking about some sort of average cost or, or, or even allowing some uh, market power in there mm -hmm. so that there's you know big difference between the marginal cost and the, and the price actually getting paid, but it right. is sort of cost-based and fair and transparent and that sort of thing. Well, things get a little more murky now, right? It, it depends on the general extent of positive externalities that you think might be present. It, it's not obvious. It, it, it depends on, on how big of a public benefit you think a piece of infrastructure is. I think with road pricing, for example, we've mm. made a decision for a long time that the public benefit's great enough that you know, we just have one essentially free price. Okay. I want to come back to both Chris and Nick on this, but I want to Tom come in first. Yeah. Well, uh, a couple of points. Um, now that we're getting lively, um, <laughs> uh, on, on your your provocative question, you know, should these, uh, uh, if if a broadband ISP with market power uh, has uh, paid priority uh, prices, or uh, now is getting into the price discrimination mode. Uh, you know, is that is that a problem? Well, you, you got to be, and, and you say if if it charges cost, is that a problem? Well, you wouldn't expect it to charge cost, yeah. either average cost or marginal cost. You'd expect it to efficiently price discriminate. And I think all economists, you know, going back to Ramsey pricing, the very fundamental uh, and simple way a, a, a firm with uh, high uh, sunk costs and and low marginal costs, that's what we're dealing with here in the broadband world, it does want to discriminate in the sense of charging the inelastic customers more and then extending the output through that. Mm -hmm. So that's important. I'd also suggest that we do look at the empirical evidence. There are a lot of assertions made about uh, artificial scarcity uh, from the fast lanes. Well, uh, 
the fast lanes, in some sense, did not come from the ISPs. Uh, they came from content delivery networks. Uh, you, you can, you know, slice it up in different ways, but the fact is that there, there have been markets developing uh, to deliver fast lanes. Fast lanes are very productive uh, without any real question of restriction of output. So to, to, to be inherently suspicious of either price discrimination or the fast lanes that are developing, uh, that, that runs into a problem on the empirical evidence that that's not necessarily where it comes from. Secondly, if the firms, the broadband ISPs with market power, are extracting uh, monopoly prices, rents, they're going to show up in terms of profits of those firms. We should look at the profits of those firms. Are they inherently profitable? And uh, Dennis Weissman and I looked at that in a, in a paper we published in 2011, a review of industrial organization, and it is it's just not the case that you're seeing those kinds of uh, profits show up uh, for all these competitors that apparently have these easy extraction opportunities. So I think the empirical evidence is on the other side of that. Um, I want to, uh, yeah, I want to give it to Nick and then me back to Chris. Although I know John wants to get in on this too, and this may be a point to kind of get to the thing that I deferred a little bit to, which is, which is, um, uh, I mean, if this is if you want to go at this it's, it, later on, that's fine. But I was sort of wondering, what, given where the discussion's going, whether this suggests things like the virtues of pricing at zero or pricing below cost or something like that on the content provider side. I mean, how, in some sense, raise that with respect to your model. But Christian's argument raises that as well, in some sense, which is if there are these spillover effects, is that an independent argument for, you know, changing things from what might be some textbook ideal pricing of the sort, perhaps, that that um, Tom just described. So, Nick, well, let please. Me, let me get back to this issue. That was, it's a, I think it's an important question. Uh, suppose we prioritize something and there is no slowdown of, of, uh, of others. It's just a relative slowdown, but not an absolute right. slowdown. Okay, first of all, if we are prioritizing video or something that has a lot of bits, it's likely that we're not going to be in this case. But suppose we think of a case which has few bits. For example, um, search. Mm -hmm. Va very valuable commodity, but doesn't have too many bits. So if we tell Google, look, um, you pay us some money, your bits are going to arrive three seconds before Microsoft. Okay? Uh, that's something that Google is going to pay for. Well, I'm not sure. I don't know. But let's see. Yeah. Suppose that it pays. Okay? And we make the same offer to Microsoft, too. And Microsoft might pay uh, if they make sure that maybe Google doesn't pay. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and so on. Now, does this idea that we're going to prioritize somebody, nobody else is going to get be slowed, but there is going to be a, relev a, re a relative slowness, mm -hmm. right? And we, means the ISP, are going to determine if Google is going to be the primary search engine or Microsoft or Yahoo and so on. That doesn't sound to me like something I feel comfortable with because we are giving the person who is administering the pipe the opportunity to select who is going to be the leader in search. That's not okay. I and I, I, I say this as an economist. Okay. Hal and then Tom. Yeah. Wait. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a bad job as traffic cop here. Uh, John had his hand up earlier. Let me just get ahead. John in. Although they, there were people responding to that, but John, why don't you go ahead? Okay. I'm well, sorry. Thanks. I was on to, I'm on to, on to a point that's been implicit for a while here okay. that I want to uh, bring out. Uh, two quick points, really. One is th I, uh, I just want to make clear that uh, when you, uh, the idea of uh, – um, banning, uh, you know, prior, uh, priority. Part of that is uh, one way to think about that is not allowing price discrimination. And just mm -hmm. as a matter of economics, that could be good, uh, which is what Hal keeps trying to argue. But could also be bad, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know, it depends on whether essentially whether uh, shifting from uh, a uniform price to allowing price discrimination is a way of um, uh, providing service to underserved groups that have relatively elastic demand, in which case it's good. Mm -hmm. But if it's a way of exploiting 
uh, users who uh, uh, have high willingness to pay and no alternatives and you know inelastic demand. Uh, you know, everyone needs search, perhaps, or, or people who really desperately want Netflix or something like that, uh, streaming video. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 it isn't necessarily good. Uh, and uh, so it's just not obvious. You just can't assume uh, that every economist would endorse price discrimination in all, in all circumstances. And second uh, is that uh, I just wanted to say something about uh, the idea that um, somehow there might be a difference between making one – uh, users uh, or or uh, end edge providers quality worse versus making others better. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, I mean, you think about that dynamically. There isn't any really any difference uh, between the two either. I'm mean, think the uh, you might say, oh, we're just offering better service to the uh, priority. Uh, uh, users mm -hmm. uh, that we've all, we've we're giving priority service, but if you're not, if the internet service provider, if the broadband provider is not investing in non-priority service, the it'll it'll be degrading that uh, service over time, and it won't look like uh, it it is uh, uh, you know uh, on its face as though it's somehow penalizing the non-priority service, but will in fact be doing so by 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 not investing in it uh, and creating congestion. And uh, so the very the simple facile idea that there's somehow a difference between Giving someone a fast lane, or uh, you know, or putting them in a slow lane, really isn't right. Mm -hmm. Hal, and then Tom. Yeah, well, let me try to. I will raise my hand to say something in response to Nick, but now no, I have something to, to Jonathan too. Well, they both said said things that offended. Um, <laughs> with, re with respect to to Nick, uh, uh, the the idea again is not that I think I think he said he doesn't want the ISP to be choosing the preferred provider, and neither do I. Just want to make sure that we're on the same page there. What 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 I want to uh, put on the table is the notion that the ISP put out an offer. Uh, and by the way, not for search. I think that, that the, the real market for this stuff, which has not yet developed, by the way, which is making this entire conversation very academic, there are no rules that are preventing this market from developing today, uh, at least since January of this year, and we don't, we don't see any such deals. But uh, setting that aside, the, the, the real market, if it were to exist, were for real-time applications. Right? We're talking about priority. We're talking about applications that, for some reason, need special handling. I keep going back to telemedicine. Uh, another, another possibility would be online gaming. You can imagine playing a game in real time with two people across the country, and you just can't tolerate any jitter, or else it would destroy the, the gaming experience. Um, but but I, I just want to I want to say that we're not talking about the ISP selecting. There shouldn't be exclusive arrangements. I actually I'm opposed to that. It's the notion that if any online gamer wants to come forward and pay extra for special treatment, uh, I don't have a problem with that, and I think that most economists don't either. Um, with respect to Jonathan's point, I've heard this back before that okay okay. Um, what if they, there's no immediate degradation, but the ISP just uh, allows the network, the base network, to atrophy over time? I hear that a lot, you know, and, and that's just another way to get them. And they may, may not be getting them in the short term, but they'll get them, you know, in a year from now. I think that, that um, uh, you know, they could have been in, engaged in those sorts of, 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 of um, tactics uh, to, to date and have not. I think that we have to count on competition to prevent them from doing that. But, but at the end of the day, it's this quality of service, it's the base level quality of service that we have to monitor. If it comes down uh, through an explicit de degradation or if it comes down through a, a gradual uh, atrophying of the network, this is what uh, I think the, the FCC sh should be focusing on. Tom. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, provoked by Nick, uh, <laughs> the, the example of Google is a great one. Uh, he poses the hypothetical, uh, what if there were extractions uh, that were demanded of Google? Uh, you pay up or we're going to slow that you down relative to, uh, to Bing or some competing service. Uh, you know, why, why should uh, these companies be, be at risk, uh, these uh, edge uh, providers that recently were startups and have brought so much innovation to the net? Well, in fact, we do have a system where those extractions can be made. That's, that's what's given us this world. That's what gave us Google. And by the way, the single most important business strategy decision in the history of Google, uh, according to some uh, uh, very well-written biographies of the company, David Weiss has it in his book and Ken Aletta in his book, uh, came in 2002 when the company was young, had little cash, was not a public corporation at that point, and they were extracted, if you want to say, by the world's largest ISP, AOL. 
and they had a decision to make. Do we pay AOL to be the default search engine? And they had to pay cash, and they had to pay a percent of search revenues. And there was an internal battle. The uh, uh, two young founders outvoted the adult supervision. Uh, Eric Schmidt, who had been you know, brought in to be the CEO and, and, and said it was too risky, we can't pay all this. Nope. Uh, the company made a, made a decision to pay AOL to be the default search engine. It was enormously valuable for the company. AOL at the time had market power, according to the, the Federal Trade Commission, of course, and, and, and that ruling had just been the year before. Uh, 34 million new customers got the Google service. The edge provider, AOL, had a, had a great product, and the rest is history. Um, it paid off. Uh, to have those transactions. So to, to hy hypothesize that these transactions are somehow going to dissipate what's happening, you have to overcome the history of actual transactions. And in some cases, those transactions have been made exactly like that. And indeed, it is very uh, customary for uh, companies like Google to pay uh, to be on. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, uh, just a, a couple of years ago, I was talking to an executive at a, an unnamed Japanese mobile carrier. Now, the, the mobile carriers in Japan are very important uh, uh, broadband ISPs. And he was complaining about Google. And uh, I said, well, you have uh, Google, is that the default search engine uh, on your service? He says, yes. And I said, well, they pay you for that, right? He said, not much, uh, not enough. I said, well, well, well why, you know, why do you have Google? Well, we have to have Google. The customers want it. That, that was the market. Okay, so that's the market here. That's what's driving things here. That's why these are hypotheticals on the one side, but there is some measure of reality to it because these kinds of transactions do take place in the non-neutral Internet. There is not a default rule in place now that says that uh, non-neutrality is, is, is the game. In fact, these are uh, very common contracts. Terms and conditions vary from, from customer to customer. And, yes, there is a lot of payment for access. Tom. I wonder if I could drag Chris back into this discussion because uh, what I think I one thing I think I got from from your uh, analysis is that because of certain positive externalities, it see, it, in a sense there might be a case for subsidizing or protecting uh, uh, access to a certain level of service by edge providers. And you know, Tom has just given sort of a you know, a, a wild and woolly marketplace example where where uh, an important innovation happened without that. I wonder if you if, if you'd like to say anything about uh, the the uh, you know sort of the the implicit subsidy that I think you were alluding to. Yeah. Well, I was responding to the question of is there an economic argument against paid prioritization, even when. Right, there, you, you made two Even in conditions, right? Otherwise it's, it's, ideal it's, type. Right, it, the market power isn't isn't being exercised. It's cost based, and it's transparent and it's open to everybody. Right, all day. right, right. Okay, and so I was just saying that there is this argument. Now, um, <clears throat> I think that you get into a question of information requirements when you choose between things that are self liquidating, you know, cost cost based actually cover their costs versus things that actually need a subsidy. Right. I mean, subsidies are appropriate under certain conditions, but there is a high information requirement there. You want to be sure that you're spending the money in a reasonable way because, right, you but know, I, where's, right, the, but, where's the information coming right, from? But so be, that would be the that would be the concern there. But yeah, but, but I, I do just think pushing because it seems yeah. to me like you were sort of implicitly suggesting that maybe this is important enough. Maybe I'm putting words into your mouth here. Or well. Yeah, you're putting words into my mouth if it comes to outright subsidy, like from general government revenue or something. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're but if you're talking about the the sort of implicit, it's not exactly a subsidy, but the well. but the but the sort of the the sort of potential for a social welfare gain due to managing the market, you know, due, due to sort of changing the rules of the market yeah. to to you know, yeah. I mean, I think there I think there could be a um, I think there could I mean, be. I guess there is kind of a long history of you know sort of trying to, you know, in essence, cross subsidize from within the 
the uh, the industry price structure without right. having to go right. to the right. legislature and ask for a particular appropriation. But right. it is right. it's, it's it's a subsidy it, nonetheless. It, it, it is right, right. Yeah. I mean, if I may be a little provocative and respond to what Tom just said, um, you know, he's kind of throwing up examples which don't seem very inspiring to me. He's basically saying there are these cases of market power. There are these cases of market imperfections. I mean, you could, it's almost a little bit like saying there are cases of, you know, corruption or something like that. I mean, it's not, not the same. I'm not saying that was corrupt, but, but you know, it's, it's the same, it's, it's the same kind of argument. It's like there's bad stuff out there, therefore, you know, therefore we shouldn't try to fix anything. And um, I'm not sure I quite follow that, actually. Well, I, can I just clarify? I'm yeah. Like, I wasn't suggesting it was inefficient, anti-competitive, uh, or uh, a problem to be fixed. I was, I'm was. i sorry I was unclear. I was suggesting that this is the, the activity that's generating this uh, very substantial, and as described by the FCC, by the way, uh, very nicely in the open Internet order, an open Internet. This, this, these are the sorts of transactions that are occurring, and they're not... You know, they're they're not the they're not the neutral uh, sort of uh, common carrier type of transaction that you would expect if you wanted to institute law that presumed uh, that you know all services are going to be treated alike and and they're not going to be any of these special preferential deals or you know payment for access and so forth. So I wasn't I wasn't saying that that's a market imperfection. I was saying that's the way the market's working. So you really believe that we should give the ability to uh, to the ISPs to pick up who is going to be the the head guy in search and the head guy in video and so on? I mean, that doesn't like, really like they have sense. like they have today. That, I'm not giving it to them. That that's how we got here. That's well, we, how Google we, got here, and that's how that's how all these services. I'm not too sure. Twitter I mean, and Facebook. You're not sure that they got here that way. Yeah, that's right. I'm not sure they got here right away. And even if they did get here that way, I mean, the present hearing is about the possibility of making restrictions or not. Should we have restrictions or not? Just to say, well, things happened before. Okay, things happened before. But the real issue is, should we do things this way or that way? Should we put restrictions or not? Should we allow for artificial scarcity or not? That's the issue. Um, uh, yes. Can I, can I just ask a clarifying question, please? Oh. It seems as though prioritization and paid prioritization are being used synonymously in this discussion, or at least freely. Hal's example of prioritization for medical purposes, I didn't hear you saying that you charge special for that. We just said, here's an important application. Maybe you would charge special. Can you parse this discussion by that differentiation? Is there something different between prioritization, a 911 call gets prioritized, and paid prioritization, which is the kind of discussion you've been having here for a second? Well, at least, uh, uh, at least in my view, uh, the 911 call could be put under special managed services and therefore would not be on the normal Internet, if I can put it that way. I'm sure your words are better than mine. Yeah, and also I think that um, if if there's a requirement to provide a certain uh, service level for a 911 call, you know, maybe maybe placed on a on a carrier by the FCC, that's not so different from saying that somebody bought priority. It's just that it, it's just that the client in this case is is you know the FCC using a uh, regulation as opposed to a uh, private firm using money. But either way, there's a okay. Well, let's let's step let's step back from the uh, that a bad example. Is there call. a difference between prioritization and paid prioritization? Does the exchange for value change the economics of what you all have been debating? Well, I mean, if if you if you mandate a zero price, which is where I think the original um, uh, proponents of net neutrality were heading, you won't have. Prioritization. Why would the ISP ever offer something uh, for zero, particularly if there's a cost involved? They, they would. Actually, they, they might. Some, there has to be. There has to be prioritization to some extent. The, and they manage. All the ISPs manage. You know, they try to keep out uh, viruses and uh, they try to manage the network for congestion issues. Uh, and and so they, that's why again, reasonable network management is always a carve out in any of these rules. 
I'm with Tom on that. I mean, the, the networks have to put some prioritization so that they run smoothly and satisfy the consumers more. The issue has to do with payment. The payment is the crucial thing because the payment can create uh, these incentives which I think are perverse uh, the, from the point of view of public interest, but I think they're very natural from the point of view of the ISP, from the point of view of the business point of view, because from the business point of view, it makes perfect sense to create the artificial, mon uh, the artificial scarcity and make more money. That really doesn't make sense from the public's point of view. Thanks. Um, but could I, could I also just on that very same point, yeah. there, there's a lot of prioritization that takes place, not by the ISP. So uh, again, to use uh, Google, a, a great example for a lot of things, they have their a, a private network. I mean, it's it's referred to sometimes as Googleware because it's, uh, you know, they're they're getting they're speeding their bits around the internet uh, on a priority basis. Uh, to make their service faster and more responsive to customers. So they're paying for priority, uh, but they're vertically integrated, as we say. And so, you know, that's paid partization. I don't see how that is anything but pro-consumer and efficient. Is that, is that relevant to the terminating monopoly issue? So, so Google sells a prioritized service. They are in the business themselves of prioritizing where you get on the ad list. Then, as you just explained, they develop their own, they're, they're the a large owner of fiber and got their own CDNs, etc., all over um, the world. So they pro then they reach the terminating monopoly, and the discussion that we're having here is the relationship to the terminating monopoly, Absolutely. not all the other things you d you discussed. But 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 the the point that the market is developed in that way is very empirically important because it shows you where some of these efficiencies are, and that it is efficient to have large investments made in faster lanes. And so you, you have to take that information and in interpreting what's happening elsewhere. You're right that they're not, you know, they're, you get to, to, to do different questions at the end of the line, literally. Uh, but the, uh, the fact that you're seeing the fast lanes built, investments made, it's costly to do it, that's paid prioritization. I wanted to make that point. Um, there's a, there are so many things on the table here, and I you know, the discrimination incentives, um, the role of antitrust and case by case versus and all that stuff. I don't want to, I want to come back to those, but before, if, if you have like, if people can talk about something for, a f for 15 minutes or so before taking a break, I want to come to a theme that I know Commissioner Rosenwurzel has raised, um, I just presented a talk a couple of days ago at the thing that John had over at Georgetown, um, and it's been mentioned here by, by some people, which is, the role of experimentation. I mean, there's been a, you know a lot of talk about, um, a, and others on the panel have raised this one way or the other. There's a lot of talk about, you know, what could happen, what would happen, what the data say, how one interprets this example, and so on. Um, and and one thing that 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 the comments I heard a couple of days ago and some other things I've heard have sort of provoked is just sort of wondering, and I don't have an answer to this, and there may be no way to do it whether there's any way to experiment with this. And and to even suggest something has probably caused trouble is to say, you know, doing it, I mean, experiment means kind of, is there a small sample opportunity? Is there a doing it here but not there? Is it, you know, I mean, is, is there just some way to, to uh, you know, to gather more evidence that would be useful on this? I mean, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm a theory guy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to sort of take my best guess and go with it, but, but, um, but you know, people made a lot of claims about what could happen, what would happen, and so on. Um, and and that may just be the world that we're sort of left with. But I'm just, I was just sort of curious, given the, the the potential value of experiments in other contexts, the rural broadband experiments and that sort of thing that we that the FCC has going, whether there's, whether anyone has ever thought of any way to do that with this. And the answer may well be no. In which case, we can get to the break sooner. But I was, but I was, but I was, but I was really curious whether there was some some way to, that way or some other way of, of kind of like evidence generation. We have had experience with open access rules. Can you say more about that? Well, these, these were rules on uh, in, in broadband delivery in the United States, we have two major wireline players uh, in virtually all markets. One is uh, delivered by the local telephone carrier, the other by the local cable operator. And cable modems have never been regulated for open access. There have been requests and thoughts about it. 
and those were rejected by the commission through the uh, late 90s and uh, um, then in uh, 2005 there was an important court case, Supreme Court decision that sort of ended that pursuit and shortly thereafter the uh, commission decided to take away the uh, common carrier uh, obligations for broadband of the uh, uh, of the local telephone companies. A, a couple of years previous to that they had actually gone a, a considerable distance to take off what had been open access requirements by eliminating a policy called line sharing. That was early 2003. And you can look at the the, the, the broadband race. You can look at the numbers uh, for subscribership, you know, the end user outcomes uh, that are important. I think John brought that up. And uh, you can see that uh, DSL, when, when it was regulated, was lagging far behind uh, cable modem service in terms of subscribership. And after the deregulation, uh, two-part deregulation, there was a very substantial kick up very immediately. It was not uh, accounted for by uh, the DSL market, which could have gotten better in the you know, technological breakthroughs on that side or cost advantages in, in DSL equipment because you can look at the Canadian market and see the Canadian market did not have the same uh, switches in, in regimes. And uh, so you do have empirical evidence from open access rules that were applied and then not applied. And I think the evidence is strong there. You also have some evidence from fiber to the home. Uh, a big issue in fiber to the home in the United States, and this was 10 years ago, uh, was whether or not that would have open access obligations, that there would be uh, a kind of a, a neutrality rule for, for how the, the system was used. And only when those obligations were peeled off, really, in, in, in 2003, 2004, did you get fiber to the home in the United States. And, we, you know, we have a substantial uh, percentage of the population that, uh, that does have fiber to the home in the United States. Um, as a result of that, I believe. I believe there was a causal relationship. Certainly there's uh, some third-party evidence on that, meaning not from the industry, but uh, uh, from uh, outside vendors, uh, those predicting uh, uh, you know, the sale of, of, of fiber, actual uh, fiber, uh, as a result of the, those rules. So I think that that, uh, to the extent that those rules are in many respects similar to net neutrality should be examined and the, and the impact there should be examined. And, you know, I sort of like the spirit of what Jonathan Baker said about looking at what happens when you, you know, do away with the rules. Obviously, we like those regime switches and we had uh, an, open act, uh, an open Internet order uh, from very late 2010. Uh, you know, he says, you know, for, for uh, two, what was it, two years? Uh, two years, he said the market, uh, the market, uh, didn't get worse, well, did the market get better? Uh, I, I believe that the, that's a very weak test for the fact that the rules were overturned. Uh, there was a lot of expectation in the market it would be overturned. There, to my knowledge, there was no enforcement uh, because of the pending uh, litigation. And uh, so look, looking for that to, to see much effect, but you can't, you can't make it a one-sided test. You know, did the, did the market get better as a result of open access? Did you get a lot, of, a lot more innovation on the edge? And, and, um, and, and with the innovation on the edge increasing, you get more investment by the broadband providers themselves to accommodate that. I don't think we saw that, but, uh, you know, it's a very short, te very short uh, window, and I don't think there was a lot of expectation the rules would be enforced because of what did, in fact, happen uh, w with the litigation. Um, uh, John and then Hal. Okay, so, so I really like the idea of experimentation, and... It's just a reality that we live in a complicated world. So the notion of an honest-to-goodness scientific controlled experiment is going to be really difficult. Uh, I also will say, though, that I applaud Commis Commissioner Rosenworcel for pointing out that, that what she was advocating was not necessarily small experiments, but larger experiments. And larger experiments, too, are going to be very difficult to quantify. But we've already been running an experiment. We're, we're running an experiment today. We've been running it for a while now. And you can go back to the evidence and ask yourself the question, what has actually happened in the marketplace? What's the evidence of a let's, what has been referred to as a light touch regulatory regime? And I know there are nuances about when particular orders were implemented and when they were overturned. But by and large, this has been described as a light-touch regulatory approach. And what we have is not a set of unequivocal evidence, but a set of unambiguous evidence mm -hmm. on the empirical metrics of output, of innovation, investment, price, and quality. 
We know that output has exploded. All the, all the evidence and the, the data are right here at the FCC on the output of bits flowing through the Internet have gone up. We know that electronic, electronic commerce has increased dramatically. We know that there has been tremendous innovation in the number of apps that have been offered and, indeed, in very disruptive, innovative technologies and companies coming online like Uber and Airbnb that are massively disrupting, in a very positive way, the ability of consumers to satisfy their needs. We know that, um, that in terms of uh, innovation, uh, we've seen dramatic innovations. We know that in terms of the quality of service that's happening by, for consumers, it's gone up dramatically by way of the higher speeds that are happening. And we know that the price per megabit transacted or, or going through the Internet has fallen tremendously. So it's not as though we don't have some evidence from the implicit experiment that we've already been running. I'm sorry, I didn't get what the event was. You said the output was ex exploding when, just in general? The over, over, over the last decade. So if you, if you look at how much output, uh, how many bits are traveling through right. the Internet, uh, at any given moment in time, it's it's gone up dramatically. No, I, and I and economists like the idea of output expanding as opposed to output uh, decreasing. It gets back to Nick's point about artificial scarcity. Do we really – we can worry about it as a conjectural matter, but do we really need to worry about it as a matter of evidence? Yeah, and the answer well. there, I think, is – is as I said, but Nick, Nick's, uh, Nick's point is that you know, and you know, I sort of said this uh, as well. I, I agree that you know the open internet has evolved without uh, net neutrality rules, and that's that's quite something. But Nick says, well, what about the counterfactual? You know, maybe we would have gotten Facebook five years earlier if we had had a, a more neutral internet, and it would be and it would be better, and we would and we wouldn't have so many friends. <laughs> but I mean, think of the thought experiment that 11 years ago. The major ISPs said uh, we're going to put prioritization, paid prioritization, on on search. I, no matter what you say about Google having paid AOL, I would bet Google wouldn't have made it. And I'm not saying this is a proponent of Google. I don't work for Google. I have nothing to do with this. But still, it's important that the industry doesn't get calcified. We don't create a, an internet which would keep the market positions the same, and we should allow people to new people to come in um, with relatively small costs and so on. Let me uh, give Hal a chance. I promised him, and then John, because I promised him. Yeah. Okay, so I want to say, if you want to experiment, you need to flip the presumption around and give case by case a chance. See what when you make the when you make prioritization presumptively in violation of the non-discrimination. Uh, um, condition, which is exactly what the 2010 order did, you don't get experimentation. Now, unfortunately, the, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, the D.C. Circuit said that, 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 that forcing ISPs to give it away for zero if it's presumptively uh, in violation of the non-discrimination rule is tantamount to common carriage. So you, you can't feed, I don't want to feed the commission right back into that same buzzsaw and saying keep the presumption. It sounded like like Jonathan may have been arguing this, maybe not. I don't know where he comes down on Title II. But just to go right back in under 706 and say make the presumption uh, that, it's, that, it, that any priority is inherently evil uh, and it should be stamped out, you're not going to get any experimentation. If you want to see experimentation, flip the presumption around. See what happens. It's conceivable. Look, we've been going 11 months, or, or we've been going almost a year now, and there is no market for prioritization yet. I realize Comcast is still subject to the to the conditions from the merger order, uh, but there have have been no other priority deals. Um, if you want to see an experiment, you know you have to allow one to occur. Uh, John, uh, a couple quick points. Uh, one, but they'll be quick. The uh, the, fir the first is that uh, we we do get experimentation now. We get a lot of experimentation by edge providers developing new uh, new kinds of applications, and and uh, that's the kind of experimentation we like because uh, they are that's benefiting uh, future consumers who aren't sitting at the table, and uh, 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 it's the uh, 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 and the. Uh, and, that, and obtain spillovers that Chris has been uh, talking about uh, uh, at length. The uh, and and with respect to the uh, you know interpreting the history of the recent uh, um, uh, past, 
the, uh, yes, the Internet's been very successful, as John was saying, and, uh, and it's not surprising. It's a general purpose technology, and there's all this experimentation on the, on the edge, and, and a lot of investment by, uh, by network providers as well. Um, uh, and, uh, and, the, and one important reason is surely that the Internet has been historically open. And but we're but, but the uh, but not uh, uh, the problem isn't uh, uh, the reason isn't light touch regulation per se, uh, which is what we're uh, I think what John was talking about. It's the it's the fact that it's been open. And what's different now is that uh, you know uh, compared to the to the past uh, the, is that the um, the uh, we we have new technologies for the. Uh, for uh, you know, the incentive to, to exclude and to exploit the terminating monopoly is 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 growing because the, of the increased ability of broadband pro providers to uh, uh, make fine distinctions in handling traffic like deep packet inspection, but also by things like I mentioned before, the growth of uh, of edge providers like Netflix and YouTube that compete with broadband providers and the increased interest of broadband providers in providing in, in offering edge services. So we're in a world where we're developing a greater ability and incentive for there to be problems. And the, and the fact that we haven't seen it uh, uh, much in the past is really not a great guide to what's going to happen uh, going forward. Thanks. Um, my, uh, my fantasy that we'd all figure out what to do and go home in 20 <laughs> minutes has been dashed. Uh, however, my, my concern that we wouldn't have enough stuff to talk about until 5 o'clock has also been pretty much allayed. So why don't we um, take about a 15-minute break, start again at 3.35, and I want to return to some of the issues that have come up before and also maybe get some specific remedy-type issues which have also come up. So thanks very much, everybody. Okay. Uh, Thanks uh, again to the panel and to the uh, chairman and the commissioners um, and to the, uh, the people here and to the people um, watching. I have, a, I have a question I'm going to ask later when it fits into the discussion that, um, that's come from Auckland, New Zealand. And not just think about the global part of that, but think about what time of the day it is in Auckland, New Zealand. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> it's like, you know, must not be a lot on cable TV in Aqua New Zealand right now, I guess. Uh, anyhow, but it's actually it's a good question. It's something I'm going to get, I absolutely do want to get to, involving remedies. Before I get to the remedy stuff, and actually I'm, I'm starting to keep my eye on the clock here, is um, there were... You know, there are just a lot of things, obviously, that were touched on in, in the discussions that we've had so far, which has just been great. Um, uh, and one of them is that I'd like to hear more about, if possible. Um, you can talk about, let me sort of bring it up in like three different ways so people can kind of grab at it. One was, um, Hal's critique of, of Nick's models in terms of the assumptions or whatever involved in in uh, in supporting the idea that that payments for payments to support ISP should come from just one side of the market. Um, uh, you know the the subscriber side, but that but that in some sense the the content side um, shouldn't at least indirectly be charged anything. One can sort of throw onto that the idea that any charges to them end up being paid by subscribers anyhow. That's another sort of wrinkle on that. Um, but but w one way to put it is is something that that either uh, that somebody brought up earlier, I'm not exactly sure, but certainly it's, it's a big thing around here is um, is you know we've heard about this virtuous cycle. I think got mentioned again by by somebody. And the, the virtuous cycle is um, that uh, by um, by making sure that the costs are down, that the prices are are low or zero for content providers, um, <coughs> that you get the kinds of effects, maybe those spillovers that Chris was talking about, but you, that you get, you know, more innovation or you know more entry, that sort of thing at the content side. And that's and then subscribers, potential subscribers, then say, "Wow, look at all this stuff! You know, I'd like to get 
get broadband or get better broadband or whatever, and th and then that and then the subscribers because they're the ones who are paying the freight end up that creates an incentive for the ISPs to do that, and so um, and so what I'm curious about is is and this gets to the two-sided pricing thing, so I'd like to start with Nick on this because he can maybe tie in a response to Hal's point earlier, is well, could the virtuous cycle go in reverse? I mean, could one make the argument that, um, uh, that if you charge lower prices to subscribers, you get more subscribers. People would say there's a bigger audience out there. You get more content providers who say that, well, more people out there would pay for a higher speed service, and they demand a higher speed service, and that gets, you know. In other words, does the circle just go clockwise but not counterclockwise? And, okay. and so, and that kind of gets to how should we price this thing in the first place, and Nick's thought about that more than probably anybody. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I, actually, the, the virtuous cycle is very important in this issue um, because the consumers would like to have more content and more applications, and the applications guys also would like to have more consumers. Right. So uh, early economics models were talking about one network effect, and here we have two network effects, two <laughs> full cycle reinforcing each other. And uh, that, um, in very broad terms, that means that we should find ways for uh, these goods to be provided at the lowest possible price be to, to sustain that cycle. Sure. Now, of course, if we start subsidizing, if we start the pricing below cost, then we have to find some way to make this money. So I'm not advocating that at all. But still, there is this issue that is behind all these, um, all these models. Let me also say, talking about models, so it's important that we have network effects and we should try to reinforce them. And, of course, the ISPs have no reason not to reinforce them, in my opinion, because they make money in the process of, of reinforcing them. So that's not bad for them. Mm -hmm. um, it might be that they have different priorities. They want artificial scarcity and so on. But even if we start with the status quo, they're doing pretty well. Now, in terms of models, and I don't want to get into the specific assumptions of the models that Hal mentioned, because uh, this audience is going to go to sleep very quickly. I, I, I'm not going to present any models. There are many models around. Um, unfortunately, there are few compared to the literature on network neutrality because most people who have written on network neutrality, neutrality are lawyers or advocates of various parties. Now, the problem, I have to say from the beginning, though, is complicated uh, if you're trying to write an, a model an, or an economic model because um, there is the possibility of two sides, which you have to consider, um, and additionally, there is a possibility of diversity of consumers, and there is diversity, of course, of the content providers, mm -hmm. and um, um, the, there is the, the possibility of, of additionally of competition between ISPs, even if it's limited competition, if it's only two of them, uh, if, even if it's duopoly, there's still something that should be taken into account. Um, that means that all the models I have seen, in, including mine, are in some way in some way have some limiting assumption. It's, 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 I, I have never seen a model that does full justice <laughs> to, to the problem. And I don't think there is a possibility to actually write such a model. I mean, it will, be, it will not really be something that will happen, I think, in my lifetime. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, so we, we should be a bit humble about this. We have results. There are lots of results. But they are all with some limiting assumptions. And I, uh, you know, I, I, as I said, I mean, I, I don't take this issue lightly when I say strict re uh, regulation should be imposed because I, I don't see an, another way, um, a better way out for it to be, to be done through competition. Okay. Um, Hal, sure. I guess? <laughs> well, and I'll try to keep this um, light and fluffy. But what, what, the, what, the, well, what the model <laughs> does, though, is it, it, it highlights... Which model? I have written oh, five papers. Oh. No, I think it's called economics, information of economics and policy, and there was a reply, a reply that was published by Dr. Kevin Caves uh, in the same journal. 
And so what, what, the, what that model, I'm talking about that model in particular, highlights is a tension, a conflict, if you will, between the interests of the content providers and of consumers, right? It is true that Nick can find a set of parameters such that total welfare, which, is, which includes the welfare of content providers, right, uh, exceed, is, is higher than any, under, under any other circumstances when you restrict the payments to just users, right? But it is also true that if you embrace a consumer welfare standard, that consumers are worse off under such a restriction. And it, it begs the question, you know, whose interests are we looking out for here? Are we looking out for the interests of Google and the content providers? Right, which, which are certainly promoted when you restrict payments from that side of the market, or are we looking out for the interest of consumers? And if it's the latter, and I argue that it should be, right, then a user pay restriction will unequivocally, under any parameterization of his model, make consumers worse off. I, I think that I, I will not really get into the model. I think I'll spare you the, the, this, this issue. I, I, I think we're off subject here. I mean, I'm, I'm really do. I mean, every model is going to have some assumptions and some limitations. I don't think that you came here to hear a, a debate about models. So I'm going to shut up about that. Go on. So, so I'm gonna, <laughs> let, me, let me be very sympathetic to Nick in this regard. And that is that I think economic theorists in this, in this business have a incredibly daunting task in front of them because the world is very complex. And, and, and my hat's off to Nick and other serious microeconomic theorists for trying to simplify the world a bit and to get to, to uh, illustrate some level of clarity in that world. What those models have consistently shown is, that, is the answer, we don't know. That's what, they have, that's what they have consistently shown, is the answer that, that we don't know what the effects of imposing a, a, a true net neutrality rule would be. So as, as complimentary as I want to be to Nick for, for taking that on, I think, as I, as I indicated at the outset of my remarks, I think we have to turn to the empirical evidence. I think we have to ask the question, How's the market doing under the current regime? And there I think I've, I've spoken to the, to the notion that I think the empirical evidence is speaking pretty clearly rather than, uh, than looking simply at the theory. I wanna, at the same uh, time, I mean, I have to say that we're not really at the world we don't know. We know what we know. I mean, yeah. there, are, there are models. I don't want to discuss them here because I really don't think that's the best way to use the time of the hearing. Uh, I really w will not, but th th everybody who, who has a bit of mathematical knowledge of economics and reads the models knows what we know. It's not that we are in a world of not knowing. Uh, mm. Sometimes the result requires assumptions, and like we, 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 it always does. So I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should, but I, I, I guess I just want to ask one question, probably in defense of, of theory, <laughs> which I uh, sure. which I mix work and others which I certainly admire in this. And I think part of a, a, a virtue of, of that kind of thing uh, is that it tells you, it was, you can tell you what you'd like to know. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, one of, the, one of the problems is probably why I asked the experimentation question is, um, you know, because we haven't really run an experiment. I mean, certain things have happened, certain things have gone up, and prices have gone down, or whatever's whatever's happened. But it's you know, but it it wasn't like there was again there was no controlled experiment here. It wasn't like that that we had an economy that was otherwise identical, but we did this instead of this, or didn't do that instead of that, and that sort of thing. Which which means that that perhaps to get a handle on the sort of the better or worse kinds of questions, you know, maybe there's something out there like it would be nice to know if, you know, the elasticity of demand for this was bigger than the elasticity of demand. I mean, again, I don't want to, I appreciate very much Nick's reluctance to, to, uh, to, to you know, to, to keep this at a level that normal people uh, won't regard as being completely soporific, but, but, uh, um, but I, I just sort of maybe now or maybe for people to think about or something like that is 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 just you know is, is just say 
you know, what we'd really like to know, given the the conceptual work that Chris has done and that Nick has done, uh, certainly of, of people here, is um, is to say, okay, you know, given that, it'd be really nice to know this or whether this was bigger than that or something like that. I mean, if it turns out to be that there's no, you know, it's kind of a useful, you know, empirical thing that we'd like to know that the theory points to, that's one question. But it, it's just, I mean, that was sort of, that was kind of really why I brought it up was to say whether there's, you know, there's always lots of assumptions and stuff like that. I, I do that in my work. We all do that in our work, that kind of thing. But is there just, is there something where in some sense people could just agree, gee, you know, if, if we knew this and given the theory we have, we know that X was bigger than Y and therefore we want to do this or that? I think that's a fair question. And um, uh, unfortunately, I have to be to start being technical. Um, um, there are conditions uh, in, at least I, let me say something about my work. My, my latest uh, paper on network neutrality, and I say latest, was published in 2012 in the Rand Journal of Economics. It is with Benjamin Hermeling of the University of California at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And that paper essentially tries to find what utility functions and for those of you who are not economists, utility function, utility is the word for satisfaction in, in economics. So what kind of utility functions um, under, make network neutrality optimal and what kind of utility functions make it suboptimal, make uh, prioritization mm -hmm. uh, optimal? Okay, so this is this type of issue. Um, what it comes down to is uh, an elasticity, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but it's um, an elasticity nobody, as far as I know, has measured. It's the elasticity with respect of the consumers with respect to delay mm -hmm. and how this elasticity uh, varies across different types of content, like right. video versus uh, email versus this and that. And as, as I said, I don't believe that anybody has actually measured such an elasticity. Maybe the issue never arose before we wrote mm -hmm. this paper. But a lot hangs on that. So if I can summarize my work on that, it depends on that. And of course, it depends on an assumption that is important in my work. I want to underline so that people don't uh, so people are sure that we're talking about the same thing, is that the consumers are not too differentiated. There can be some differentiation mm -hmm. among consumers, but right. they're not widely differentiated. Right. So there are, I mean, if I was, if I, th if I thought really the FCC could measure this elasticity, mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought that that would be, and, and similarly, if, if the consumers were of the same, of the types that I, I, I described, not too different from each other, then that would be crucial. Uh, I'm not so sure if you guys can can measure that elasticity or not, but I think it's worth uh, it's worth thinking about. Well, it's, it's always helpful to kind of know what you're aiming at. I appreciate the complexity to be sure. Yeah, this makes John. me think of something. That, uh, what Nick said, uh, it's, it may be the same thing, but you know, we we were talking before about uh, price discrimination right. and what happens when uh, if you allow some. Uh, uh, Say edge providers be charged you know, uh, for priority, and and some of the issue there, you know, has to do with uh, whether uh, if you allow certain kinds of prices uh, mm -hmm. pricing, um, whether we would uh, get the kind of beneficial price discrimination where you're going to get uh, underserved populations served, you know, right. with with elastic demand um, uh, served, or whether you're going to exploit groups within elastic demand. But the way to think about this, one way to think about it, is to understand the uh, different kind of categories of users, providers, I mean, of edge providers and, and users and their responsiveness to price. And, you know, if one could, if one really understood that more deeply, one might get a sense of what uh, uh, different kinds of pricing uh, schemes would mean for welfare in terms of, uh, you know, uh, in, in the way you're, it, in the way Nick was suggesting. And right. I think I just said the same thing he did in a, in a slightly different way uh, as, as I kind of got the, through it. There's certainly I, similar problems. And, and I did want to add one other thing. I mean, I, you know, you keep coming back to your idea of experiment. Every time you say that, I just have to, add, I keep thinking, well, why don't we pay, you know, some friendly, one friendly nation to allow pay for priority and another friendly <laughs> nation to prohibit it and see what happens. <laughs> but I, I don't think that's a serious suggestion. But that's, a, that's kind of where you're going, I think. I, I'd not say where I'm going. <laughs> uh, or whatever. But in, 
Um, thanks. Any, uh, anyone else want to weigh in on, on this? John. So just to follow up on both, both Nick and Jonathan, because I think they're talking about very similar things as we talked about in terms of, of the specific modeling that Nick has on net neutrality restrictions and on price discrimination. And there, I think what we can agree is that we're in a world where it depends. Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is going to be theoretically it depends. And in case of price discrimination, the answer to, the, to your question of what might we look at is the issue of output. We know that in the case of price discrimination, that if price discrimination has the result of reducing output, uh, it can harm economic welfare. So a condition that would promote economic welfare in, for price discrimination, that it would, that it would promote output. And I think that's basically very similar to your Proposition 1 in your, in your RAND paper, Nick. Thank you. I, <laughs> somebody, somebody read that somebody paper. Did. Somebody read that paper. <laughs> so there, I think output's a little easier to get at than, than uh, uh, maybe not perfectly to what Nick wants. But output is something that we can get to. And mm -hmm. fortunately here, I think the FCC has a nice hook. And the hook sits, and I'm not an attorney, but I can read, and, and Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act mm -hmm. grants regulating methods to the FCC to promote the uh, deployment of advanced telecommunication service. To me, that sounds like an output test, mm -hmm. and I like that. I like the idea of an output test. I think it lines up economics and and the reading of the statute, That and regulators may typically, typically think more clearly about, about a pricing constraint. That's what regulators typically have regulated. But in the case uh, at hand, what happens is output is just a corollary or a complement to price. After all, if monopolists are going to harm economic welfare, they do so by what? Mm -hmm. By reducing output to raise price. Colluding olig oligopolists, if they're going to harm economic welfare, do so by restricting output to raise price. And, and as I mentioned, in the case of price discrimination, if it's going to harm economic welfare, it would be done by reducing output. So I think the, the natural vehicle for lining up good economics and the law may, may lie right there with that Section 706 on an output test. Okay. How? Senator real quick. To answer your question, what what uh, would I like to know that we don't know now is what would the ISPs do hypothetically with a new source of, of cash flow that come from these priority deals? Now, the the I can tell you what some uh, theoretical models say about two-sided markets is that they would perceive these revenues uh, to be tantamount to a reduction in the cost of serving end users, and therefore it would put downward pressure on the price for access to, to broadband customers. Now, that's theory, mm -hmm. but we don't know if, and we don't know if that would happen in reality, but that's something that I would like to know. We do have a, in certain parts of this country, as Chairman Wheeler pointed out a few weeks ago, we, we do need more deployment, right? There is something that is stopping ISPs from pushing out fiber uh, to certain parts of the country, right? And the question is, is it possible that by constraining the ISP to raise all of its revenue on the backs of end users, there's just not enough margin there to make it worth the investment? You know, would it be possible that they would take some of these some of these revenues and use it to, to subsidize, in effect, broadband access and, and, and push out the deployment of their network? The, uh, um, I have two other quick points. Jonathan keeps using this thing about uh, Price discrimination to exploit customers with inelastic demand. I hope I got that right. Again, if if the if you can't degrade the base service from by by in response to someone saying no to priority delivery, I have a hard time understanding how you can exploit the situation. All right, I just want to I just want to establish that. We're not uh, the 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 type of offering th that I have in mind is the is the one where you don't degrade the baseline when they say no. You have to keep the quality of service constant. So I, I just asked Jonathan, how do you exploit that situation? The third, the third thing uh, that I also want to point out, Jonathan says, the experiment that we really want is to find a friendly country who allows priority and find a friendly um, who doesn't, you know, and see what happens under these different metrics. It's a bit of a false choice, and I just want to make no, sure that I know you're being facetious, but but I want to make sure that that you don't you don't hear me arguing for a laissez-faire. Just let any kind of priority deals develop, right? What 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 I think I want to steer the debate back to is 
case-by-case -case regulation of priority deals, right? We are going to come up with some ground rules and we're going to stop the, those that we think that are bad versus a per se prohibition. So I, I don't want, I don't want um, the, this, this debate to move to, you know, whether it should be priority under laissez-faire no rules or no priority at all. Um, there's a, a lot here that's been touched on and I'm starting to get a little nervous about the time, so I, let me sort of, I guess, bring up a, a, a question, actually, that, that was sort of prompted by, um, by the, uh, by, um, uh, by uh, Mr. Beltran in New Zealand, uh, which is, um, which is, what do people think of minimum quality standards? You know, that, that I mean, are they definable, enforceable, a good idea, solve the problem, don't solve the problem, you know, that kind of thing. You know, there were a big part of the NPRM, but I think a number of different approaches to those were, were offered. Um, uh, you know, there's something that's, I think, a lot of interest around the world. I'm sort of wondering whether, what people think of those as, as a partial remedy, an in ineffective, you know, a step in the right direction. I mean, just, you know, whatever on that. Has anyone thought about those as a solution as opposed to, say, out-and-out non-discrimination rules or out-and-out rules against prioritization or whatever? So, so I have one thought on that. Thank um, you. Which is that I, I sort of think we have the current Internet, the one that we're used to, mm -hmm. and we have some future developments that, that we don't know about. Right. And I think that minimum quality standards are probably a really good way of protecting the current Internet and keeping – there's a lot more innovation we can get out of the current Internet. It, it's a general purpose technology that has not nowhere near realized its full potential. There's a huge amount of new technology. There's a huge amount of new applications and new network effects that can come from, from the current modes of operation of the Internet. And I think minimum quality standards do a great job with that. There's also the future Internet. There's, there's various uh, specialized services. Actually, that's a got to be careful about that term around here, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's various uh, potential new applications that might require different kinds of levels of service from the, from the ISP. Um, maybe they're around video or telepresence or something like that. I'm low, very low latency. I'm not sure. Um, and I'm not sure the minimum quality standards would help with that because it hasn't really developed yet. So that if, the, if that sort of new form of the Internet develops in a non-neutral way, it might not be as general purpose a technology. It might not generate the same level of spillovers. So I think it's a partial remedy. That's okay. my... Go ahead. Could I try and generate a little more disagreement on this one? Because I think I heard Nick uh, earlier... Uh, making a point, which I think is valid, that it's not necessarily the level of some minimum quality, but the gap between whatever the current minimum and what can be achieved by, by others. And I think in terms of competition, that sort of strikes a responsive chord with me. And let me just add one more thing for Hal before asking for comment. So when you think about what's the standard, and leave aside the whole question of how do you define and measure minimum, you know, you know what the what the current level of of, of service is. I mean, it, it's not clear to me that you know in in a very very dynamic sector where there's lots of investment and innovation that you know maybe the 2014 uh, minimum quality or current quality is is the right one. I mean, maybe the expectation should be some kind of an improvement over time, sort of like we we did with price caps, uh, loosely speaking. Well, let me uh, start by saying that. Uh, Unfortunately, for most American consumers, uh, the, the Internet service they buy from ISPs, res the residential service, is a best efforts um, service. And therefore, they don't know, really know how much the minimum is because there is no minimum. I mean, there is a best effort service. It's 2 megabits maximum, 32 megabits maximum. It's not necessarily a, a guaranteed uh, minimum. Now, the, 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 the world is different for businesses. Businesses uh, can have contracts with ISPs that do have minimums. That's, that's different. But if we're talking about residential, um, minimums in, in that sense 
uh, inserted in on top of best efforts contracts might be useful for con- for consumers because they will know that no matter what this ISP is going to give me this minimum uh, even though he's going to make the best efforts for it to be two megabits so, or I whatever. Mean, before, yeah. before John gets to yeah. be, be clear, I, by minimum quality, I, I was thinking the quality that's offered to the content providers, not yeah. the quality the that's side. offered. Yeah. I'm sorry. On okay. the other side. So, so yeah, if, 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 if we're talking about this, uh, thank you. If you're talking about the other side, uh, then uh, as, as you correctly said, uh, Jonathan, the, uh, the, the, the small differences in delay can create very significant shifts in the allocation of demand among um, um, uh, content providers who are providing similar stuff, let's say, search, which a lot of consumers think that the, the, the search is, is similar between Google and, 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 and Bing and so on. So um, that, that means, like you said also correctly, that setting the minimum will not really necessarily fix the problem. If the problem that we're discussing is artificial scarcity, just defining a minimum will not fix it. And you can really define a minimum and a maximum, I hope. So <laughs> I think you're not going to, to, to force them to have only one speed only, uh, no matter what. You know? So we, we're talking about uh, giving them the ability to have prioritization, but not paid prioritization, so they don't create the artificial scarcity. John. Uh, uh, I suspect there might be technological problems in implementing this that are not for our panel, but right. putting, but, but I want to make a conceptual point, uh, uh, which is that um, minimum quality standards can lessen the incentive to uh, discriminate by reducing the payoff, mm-hmm. uh, you know, f- to exclusionary conduct. But they have they don't do anything to address the the, the gatekeeper or terminating monopoly problem. So they aren't a, a, a solution to the uh, to you know all that ails the uh, you know all all, the, all that we might be concerned with uh, in protecting the, vi- the virtuous circle. Um, Can I just yeah, also Tom. mention that there? I mean, you really have to look at the uh, practicalities of regulating quality. And Jonathan got uh, close to it by saying this is a very dynamic industry, and uh, uh, if quality is improving year on year, uh, maybe. Maybe the rule should be that quality has to go up. Well, <laughs> um, so, so, so so you have a proceeding, you have a rulemaking for what the what the what the quality is going to be, what the speeds are, what the customer service aspects are. Um, you know, as, as Nick points out, small differences create big gaps in terms of service outcomes. So you know, and and. Uh, and of course, you know, Jonathan kind of puts the, the twist on it when he says that you can depreciate service by just not investing, just not investing. So how can the commission be in the, you know, be in the position of saying, look, this is what you have to invest? In? Well, you're back into public utility regulation. You really are. That's, that's what that is. Now, there was an experiment to try to do something like that at the Federal Communications Commission without being a public utility commission. And that was cable rate regulation. And when you regulated cable rates after the 92 Act uh, through FCC um, uh, rulemakings, uh, the quality issues came right up. How can you, how can you, you know, you set a price cap, you have to have something in there about quality. Well, the FCC was um, politely uh, wholly ineffectual at regulating quality. And that comes from the FCC itself deciding to back off rate regulation and the 96 uh, telecom, telecom Act sort of followed that up. Turns out there was no effective uh, rate regulation even given the, the, the tools the Commission had to nominally regulate uh, basic cable prices because they couldn't regulate the package, the quality of the package effectively. And so here you're, you're in a parallel situation, some differences, but some striking similarities. So uh, I think I think you have to be realistic about it, and um, given the, the time for an FCC rulemaking, given the speed of change in the marketplace with the technology you're talking about, uh, it seems unlikely the FCC is going to be a good uh, regulator based upon historical precedent. I think 
think Hal wanted to. Uh, yeah. So let me let me try this because it it does make me nervous to have the you know the idea that the FCC is monitoring the connection of every you know every single content uh, uh, ISP pair. Uh, in the country, that that would be quite no, burdensome. No, 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 no. I know, no, I know, I know. But I just wanted that 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 gives me the heebie-jeebies. So so then, what's the next what's the next thing? How would how would this kind of information come forward? Well, one notion is that under a under a case by case adjudication process, the complaining content provider comes forward and says, for not accepting the offer of priority, I was degraded, and I can show you that empirically. We, we've been keeping tabs on what the ISP is doing in terms of our traffic for its customers, and this is going to be the first piece of evidence in our complaint. Uh, that would that would put the burden on the complaining party to, to, to keep track of the quality of service and take it away from the, the regulator. Um, Are you proposing that? I just made it up, but it's, um, it's out there now. Uh, before I get on to, to, to a, at least one thing that may, about the terminating monopoly issue which has come up, um, I just wanted to, Christian had said something in just a little while ago that I wanted to come back to a bit, which was, you know, the, in response to this question, which is the, the, the future Internet, you know, the, the stuff that's going to happen, all the innovation that's going to happen. A feature of this, dis of this whole discussion, it seems to me, has been a, a view that that all the innovators are on the edge provider side, and that and that broadband provision is some sort of boring pipe. And your answer suggested maybe you didn't intend to suggest it, but your answer at least suggested to me that maybe there is some you know is is there innovation going on at the last mile or in the in the delivery side that in some sense needs to be considered in deciding you know how much pricing flexibility to give people which way the you know that that sort of stuff i mean it's it's a you know i mean there is this i mean I, well, i'm just sort of reflecting a view i just wondering you you i don't know whether you intended to go there but your statement provoked that so if you or anybody else has any thoughts on that that would be great Great balancing act um, yeah. in, in this whole question. Um, clearly, the nature of the internet is uh, is one of edge um, uh, innovation, right? right. I mean, that, that's that's really key to the internet. Um, but you might worry about uh, lack of innovation, um, uh, you know, sort of in in the last mile. But you know, I think it's unclear. And and here's the story that um, that. I think is really important is that, um, and I'll need Jonathan to give me the exact date, but in around 1994, the FCC made what I think is one of the most important regulatory decisions in the development of the Internet, and that was to require phone companies to carry local calls to dial up ISPs under the same unlimited uh, uh, flat rate service that um, that any other local telephone call uh, was regulated to, mm -hmm. to under under common carriage. Um, that was not something that the telephone companies liked a whole lot at the time. And possibly, or one could argue, it might have led to maybe some less investment in, in some of the switches of the day or maybe an ISDN or, or, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, on the other hand, it was, I think, absolutely essential in fostering the national Internet ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And it led, I believe, to the eventual deployment of high-speed broadband networks because people wanted them because people had become accustomed to Internet services. So I think that is an example of a regulation which, which at the time might have seemed to be um, a little bit limiting or constraining on the telephone companies, but which in fact fostered the growth of the ecosystem, led to much greater demand, and ultimately led not only to a lot of consumer surplus and, and, and a lot of profits at the edge, but also to far more revenue and far more investment in broadband networks. Uh, so I think it can go either way. I think that's a, that's a, a, a nice example where you can't really predict the... Uh, can't really predict is a rather formidable thing when one's thinking about 
instituting policies. I'd, I'll just throw that out. I think you, out you do your it. best to, to be a steward That's right, yeah. of technological change. <laughs> That's fair enough. That's good. Um, uh, Can I just? Uh, yeah, please. I'm curious about uh, Christian's uh, example. Uh, and if you're talking about the, the, the birth of dial up ISPs, there's a nice rendition of this in, in the uh, aforementioned paper by Jason Oxman, which uh, came out of the FCC in 1999, the uh, FCC and the unregulation of the Internet. But he talks about the fact that the uh, first dial up providers came and tried to get people on the Internet. Uh, the reaction of the regulatory agency was to view the dial-up ISPs as uh, telecommunications providers and charge them access fees and uh, per minute charges for the traffic they were sending over the business lines they rented. So I don't know if we're on the same wavelength here, but uh, what happened was there was a, a carve-out uh, called uh, ESP, uh, Enhanced Service Provider, and they got split off into what has become information services, and that's the unregulated world. So that was necessary, according to Oxman, and I think everybody who's looked at it, uh, in, in, in paving the way for, for, for this, you know, this blossoming of the mass market Internet through these dial-up ISPs. And I will just uh, gratuitously say that that market was seeded very effectively in the 1990s by a walled garden known as AOL, violating every principle of net neutrality and doing it very effectively, using the incentives it got to carpet bomb America, as one author has put it, carpet bomb America with these sign-up disks that for a couple of years there we couldn't avoid, uh, and um, actually uh, bringing um, uh, you know, the, the, the Internet to um, uh, a public audience, the commercial Internet. and. Uh, so neutrality was not the principle there, and there was seeding of the market through vertical integration of, of AOL and all the content uh, that was um, available uh, only to AOL customers and, uh, you know, was look, looked down upon and, and historically is looked down upon, surprisingly, by many people who think it was not an open system. But that was just a migration of the system towards what we have today, which we do consider open. But that all happened under permissive rules, antitrust law is a background on it, but permissive rules that allowed experimentation in business models. Very, very important. That, that is precisely the regulatory decision I was referring to. Um, I think of it as a regulation of a type of openness on local telephone companies, um, on keeping the infrastructure open and neutral with regard to those providing the Internet. And it's certainly true that America Online um, was a huge beneficiary of that, but it also kept the market open and competitive and neutral so that a lot of people signed up for ISPs that weren't walled gardens, and that's what eventually forced America Online to open up. I may regret asking this, uh, but uh, Tom, the, uh, uh, the development you were talking about, to what extent was that dependent on common carrier regulation of the telephone, you know, the underlying telephone system. Yeah. So, uh, you know, to some extent. I mean, we did have a telecommunications network that was regulated through common carrier, and that underlying network hosted a lot of activity. The problem was being able to free up new investment and new innovation that was coming on the outside of that. You could not do that within the telecommunications regulation world. Uh, and that, again, that's, that's very nicely dealt with in the Oxman paper. It's, it's uh, a balance. When you, when you call it regulation, uh, there was an underlying system. You were able to get tariff services from the telecommunications provider, one of which was a business line. And that's what the ISPs did. And they had a business line coming to their, their modems. And they had banks of modems with numerous business lines connecting them. Now, when they sent data back, you know, over those telephone lines, the question was, should that be treated just like business traffic? If it were, that's the end of that story. There's no, there's no ISP because they get, you know, metered, uh, you know, every minute you got to pay the telephone company and so forth. So, so what happened was that there had to be a deregulation at the edge of that. Now, not all regulations went away. I think that's 
where Christian comes in and says, well, that was, you know, a common carrier system underlining it. Yeah. But we've, you know, through, through broadband and so forth and through the unregulated core of the Internet, uh, where there's, you know, you, you talk about paid prioritization, look at, look at what happens with, with peering and transit in the core of the Internet. Uh, the large networks tell the smaller networks that want to interconnect, no. We're not going to give you the same price we give the other large networks, which is, you know, uh, bill and keep or free, free exchange, peering. So that the transit fees that are charged for those smaller networks, that's, you know, a form of paid prioritization. Uh, the, bigger, the bigger networks with more traffic going back and forth, uh, they, you know, they charge a different price than the smaller networks that come on board. That gives great incentives for investment, and that's worked. That's, that's done nicely. And uh, people should take, take full cognizance of that very important historical development, uh, you know, with Internet growth. Um, uh, I can, at least personally, the, the fatigue factor is starting to set in, but let me, uh, let me sort of throw out just a, a, a few more things here before, uh, before the clock strikes. And I don't know whether Eric has got anything coming in. The... Um, uh, a, a question sort of, in some way, is kind of terminating monopoly related, but let me put it this way, which is, um, is wireless any kind of a way out with this or a solution to this or something like that? People say, oh, they can get it over their phone or there's some things that, or does that at least limit the universe of vulnerable parties to those where the phones don't work very well for the content or something like that? I mean, just... You know what does, you know is uh, you know is is in some in some what I'll be informal about here is wireless in the market or not? Does that help with the terminating monopoly problem? Well, it seems you know the prices better than, than I, I do, but uh, it seems like uh, the the pricing in on the on, on wireless is so much higher than the pricing in uh, in fixed that I, I don't. I don't think you can easily say they're in the same market. Um, now, there are, it's true that on the supplier side, a lot of the people, a lot of the companies that are in the fixed business are also right. in the wireless business, so that, uh, that is a consideration. Um, but I think, I, I don't know, we didn't really discuss should these rules uh, apply to everyone or be, yeah. or wireless should be excluded. Um, like in the 2010 rules, uh, I believe that uh, right now uh, it's clear that the future is going to be wireless. Um, there have been tremendous strides uh, in uh, wireless Internet since uh, the previous order. So I would say that if we really believe that uh, network neutrality is the right way to go, then it should also be imposed on, on wireless. Okay, John and Hal. So my sense uh, is that uh, wireless services are on the whole uh, complements to wireline for broadband users today, not uh, substitutes. Um, uh, and one could imagine it being different in the future, but it, I, I don't see that uh, now. And that wireless has other uh, kind of um, constraints, that there's – Higher marginal costs uh, and lower peak speeds at the at, uh, and uh, there are capacity concerns of the wireless providers um, and then there and then but also in addition the integration of the wireless and large wireless and wireline providers uh, also um, all those things collectively limit the ability of the wireless providers and their incentive to um, constrain exercise the market power by wireline providers today. Uh, the uh, you know there's some constraint, but it's not it's limited for all those reasons. On the other hand, I think I agree with Nick that you know mobile uh, demand, you know, data demand at any rate, you know, and uh, and usage is growing. Um, but I sort of see that as increasing the incentive of wireless providers to exploit the terminating monopoly, um, and and increasing their incentives to exclude, uh, because uh, I think we see large wireless. Uh, providers investing in mobile video content, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, which would give them the more they do that, the greater their incentive to exclude rival content or accept, you know, uh, uh, the same way that I, w I uh, would worry about wireline providers. 
Uh, so uh, uh, I guess I, 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 see, I certainly see that uh, as compared with 2010, there's a serious you know, uh, question whether it, that, uh, at least that we ought to uh, um, expand the coverage of, of, uh, of, uh, of discrimination prohibitions to include uh, uh, wireless as well. Yeah. All right, so <clears throat> a few points here. Uh, wireless is certainly a substitute for for a, a significant share of homes today. You just look at the substitution pattern. Cisco has done the study trying to project how many customers by year are going to be completely wireless, completely cut the cord. Um, I cite that study and many others in, in the book that I've co-authored with Bob Lighton. Um, that's just 4G. As soon as we turn the corner to 5G, we're going to talk about even a closer substitute uh, in the eyes of, of consumers. I saw a presentation by, I think, a SoftBank CEO uh, showing that at least, so he claimed, that he was able to do everything on, on, on a wireless network, at least a, a future wireless network that you could do on a wireline network. Now, now, even given that, I want to acknowledge that we're never, even if you bring wireless in and you add four more suppliers in every market, we're never going to get to a state of perfect competition, right? We're never, we're never going to extinguish entirely the incentives to do bad things, which is why I'm advocating for some form of regulation, just a light-handed form of regulation. Finally, if you, if you, there, there's a, if you uh, use the right approach, which is this light-handed approach, case by case, then I would be comfortable with bringing wireless uh, under the umbrella and having a, a basically an, an agnostic approach to technology when it comes to net neutrality enforcement. If you take a radical approach and you start using blanket prohibitions on network management uh, that can sometimes be motivated for efficiency reason, then I want wireless to be carved out. We want to quarantine the bad stuff. Um, and I think that that's the, that's the way that um, the FCC should be thinking about it. Uh, John. So just to put it in perspective, um, the, the question has to do with, with whether wireless might be part of the solution. And I think the answer that we're sort of coming to is yes. If you look at the FCC data in the year 20, 2010, we effectively had zero mobile broadband subscribers in this country. Today, we have 93 million. 93 million. That's in four years. And, and what has happened is a tremendous marketplace response to consumer demands. And while we can talk about incentives for malevolent actions, the reality is that consumers are revealing that, uh, that they have both the ability and willingness to switch carriers that, that in many ways makes an ex-ante search process um, uh, uh, eliminate the concerns, or at least mitigate some of the concerns about a terminating monopoly problem in that in that space. I think. I want to come back to the ex ante search type issue in just a second, mm -hmm. but before I do, um, uh, in thinking about wireless, the thing that that at least occurs to me is the data cap issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I mean, it's one thing to say it's fast enough to get to watch Netflix on your iPad or whatever it is, but if you have to start paying ten bucks and you know, Ten bucks an hour after the first half hour of the movie, then, then it's it's not it's not quite so uh, appealing. I mean, do, do, does anybody? Maybe this is a question more for engineers. I don't know, but if people have thought about this or that, you know, the five G thing, how it's talking about or whatever, does people do people see that going away? I mean, in a lot of ways, that's always struck me as being the impediment to leaving aside the that Verizon owns both issue that has been pointed out so too. Just just I don't want to monopolize the panel here, but just simply mm -hmm. to respond to that, I think. There's been a very consistent call in that regard mm -hmm. for enhancing the amount of spectrum that goes to this space. Consumers are demanding mobile services. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can eliminate that scarcity or reduce that scarcity, it ought to be job number one for the FCC. And by doing that, you help solve that problem. Yeah. I, I, I don't disagree with John that uh, having more spectrum available would be great for uh, uh, for consumers and for carriers in wireless. Um, I, I still see the prices so far away in wireless from, from fixed that I don't really see how we can seriously consider them in the same market, you know, at least in the, if we use the, the traditional antitrust principles of the Department of Justice, I, don't, I, I can't see them being in the same market. Uh, I 
think that it's much more likely, like John says that they are, Jonathan says that they are in, uh, in their complements rather than substitutes. Um, there is also another aspect that over time has made a difference in um, the switching of customers in, in, in wireless. Um, uh, the fact that right now a lot of customers have bundling contracts between a wireless phone and other services, um, that has made switching more, more difficult or more unlikely uh, and, of course, uh, creates uh, frictions um, that uh, are, are not usually to the benefit of consumers. I want to the, – the switching thing um, has been raised a couple of times here, and that, you know, gets to a remedy question, which I always want to make sure I've, I've gotten – we've talked about some of these already, but, but something – another sort of prominent remedy, in fact, the one that I think – not that I want to – you know, pretend to be a lawyer, but the one that I gather was more or less upheld in January was this transparency thing. And I've got two questions about that. Um, one is whether, you know, whether it's, it's kind of minimum quality standards, whether it sounds great in practice, but I wonder, or rather it sounds great in theory, but wonders whether it works, it's, it's going to work in practice. I mean, how is it going to be like the privacy notices that you get at the, you know, or, you know on every website, you just sort of hit agree and move on, and, you know. Um, or, and the other is, um, gets to points that, that have been raised in different ways, which is, um, I'm going to put it in an extreme case. If people don't switch, what's the point of transparency rules? You know, so, you know, I, I mean, if the, I mean how, how rigid is that terminating monopoly? Well, transparency is is important not only for consumers but for for the, for the FCC and for the lawyers. I mean, you know, every even if they, if if if, uh, if uh, Comcast uh, gives me 20 pages to read of my agreement with them, yeah. I would not read them, but you would, <laughs> and that would make a, that would make a difference. Be careful who you look at. <laughs> but uh, I think there is another issue of transparency that I wanted to bring up, which is not the tra- just the transparency of the of the terms, the prices, and so on. There are technical issues that might be very, very important on to the sender side, to the um, content and applications side, and uh, the extent to transparency, I mean, transparency of technical specifications um, from the ISP towards these computer companies or whoever it is on the other side that is sending the stuff. And I think that this is a different time of transparency that you and I as consumers would not care about, but I think it makes a difference. It could make a difference uh, to the, uh, to the um, people who have, especially to the applications providers on, on, on that side. So this is something for the FCC to think about, uh, how to make this tra- technical transparency more efficient. Uh, for the whole network. There are any thoughts about the, the virtue of transparency rules or how they might be designed? I think that um, transparency rules have a real benefit in, in uh, preventing some of the chilling of innovation. Um, it's not perfect, mm-hmm. but uh, if you know what you're going to have to pay on various carriers for a certain type of service, Mm -hmm. then if you are a uh, innovative company and you're kind of wondering, you know, what's it going to take? What are the costs of doing business in this in this area? And how do I how do I ensure that whatever value I create isn't expropriated by by some intermediary? It helps. Uh, It helps a lot with that because it it introduces you know a certain amount of predictability. Um, that wouldn't be there otherwise. It doesn't solve the problem, but but uh, it helps. Yeah, what I'm hearing so far is that the, is that the important transparency is upstream rather than downstream. Well, so yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, you know, you were talking uh, this this whole discussion of of consumers switching ISPs. I don't think it really matters how many ISPs we have, how much wireless is a is a substitute. Um, you know, th- those those are great from for just consumer side things like reducing the the subscription price and that and that sort of thing, but. Uh, consumers aren't going to be switching ISPs um, over these terminating monopoly issues. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe a couple services. Yeah, if they block Netflix or make it cost twice as much, that might induce somebody to switch ISPs. But for the vast majority of Internet companies that only have a tiny, tiny fraction of people's time, mm-hmm. you know, nobody's going to switch over that. So th- this isn't going to alleviate all these types of competition. They're not going to alleviate that problem. 
Well, then why don't they do it? And why aren't there high profits? And, and all right, let's let's look for some empirical evidence that this happens. I mean, that yeah. that what happens? that, that you, you're yeah. going to have these extractions and exclusions. If if yeah. if these ISPs have this terminating monopoly, uh, go, you know, you, there's no law against it. Go ahead and do it, and let's let's go find where it happens. We're still projecting and crafting hypotheticals when, in fact, there should be evidence of this. Um, Hal and then John. Yeah, I want to I want to come back um, to this issue of user directed priority, which seemed to 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 provide a path of compromise um, in the first uh, week of the FCC's roundtable, and and how it relates to transparency. Because now it seems like if we're going to involve the user in the priority decisions, we have to be transparent, right? The 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 ISP would have to disclose that it has been approached by an online, you know, telemedicine or uh, gaming provider uh, that wants to see better handling of its packets than the status quo, and we are we are prepared to receive X dollars in exchange for that service. Um, is this something that that you guys uh, would want to take part in? Um, is this uh, what what is it going to take effectively to make this happen? It seems to me that that if if we are going to go down the path of user directed priority, then transparency about these sorts of arrangements uh, need to be, uh, are vital, and, the, and the, that information needs to be relayed to the customer. John. So it's hard for a group of economists to argue that less information would be, would be better for economic welfare. Right. The only consideration is what are the costs of, of, of generating those transparency rules. So I think you're going to find agreement in that regard. The role for that transparency that I think hasn't quite been stated is the one that, that Christian was on, and that is, did you like to inform consumers so they can make choices about which carrier they want to use? And it's when consumers have the ability and willingness to switch carriers that you get a vibrancy of competition. And then that brings us to the second issue, which is the one of switching. Mm -hmm. And you speculated if consumers won't switch yeah. then what's the role of, of the transparency rules and then what I do is I'd suggest that we go back to again what I suggest in my opening remarks is what are the, what does the evidence say what do we actually know about consumers willingness to switch well if you again we have these data you know that the annualized churn rates in the mobile telephony industry are in double digits and that turns out to be true, I think, in terms of the in willingness and intent of, of high-speed broadband consumers to switch as well. So you have to ask the question, if a firm is, is faced with the loss or demise of that large a chunk of its customer base on a, on a six-month or an annualized basis, does that not bring a competitive pressure? And I think the answer you're going to come to is, that's a good thing uh, that consumers are willing to, to willing to switch. John. Uh, so a couple things. Um, uh, I want to second something Chris uh, started with, which is that um, uh, uh, it seems unlikely that uh, consumers would uh, know what service pri pri um, priority that broadband uh, providers would give individual edge providers, you know, how do I know, you know, what service provider, you know, for Yelp or something like that, uh, you know, except for really high profile ones, uh, even if uh, they're required to have some kind of disclosure. We all know about, uh, you know, the disclosures we read in those contracts. We, we don't read in those contracts, too. Um, and even if an end user has a uh, possible alternative broadband uh, uh, service providers, it can be very costly to switch. And that was the point that I guess maybe Nick was making about, you know, what if the broadband is bundled with your cable and video service? That, that really raises the cost yeah. of switching. Um, uh, and not only that, um, uh, whichever, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, um, if, if, a rival, if, uh, if, mul if I have rival, bro if I can uh, deal with rival broadband providers, but they all charge the same for priority to the same – charge the same end user, I'm sorry, edge provider for priority, uh, uh, what, I don't get any, I don't, and my switching won't make any difference uh, to, to uh, uh, discrimination against that, that uh, edge provider anyway. So, it, so uh, the, it's, not a, it's not a panacea on that, on that score either. Um, and, and on uh, uh, John's point about switching, well, you have to think about, 
you know, I mean, the mobile, if you, I mean, I guess John takes the view that mobile and, and uh, wireline are, are uh, substitutable and so that, you know, the switching in the, uh, among the mobile providers is, is relevant. Uh, I don't think they're as substitutable as he does and so I don't, I don't uh, uh, and in general I, th I worry particularly about broadband uh, providers who, um, who uh, uh, I'm sorry, broadband users who would, are willing to pay a premium for very high speeds. And the higher the speed, it seems to me, the less the alternatives are and uh, the less ability that uh, uh, customers have to switch in any event. Uh, so even facilitating switching with, uh, even to the extent transparency would do so, it doesn't exactly help anyway. Let me just add to, to what Jonathan just said. I mean, transparency, and I think that's what John said that as well, transparency is not going to solve the problem of uh, uncertainty that will be facing consumers if... Um, there, are, there is prioritization because the consumer will never really know. When, when, when it sees Columbia University's page come before NYU's, it would be very hard for the consumer to know that Columbia paid the, ads pro, the, paid the ISP and NYU didn't. They will just think that NYU is just jerks. I mean, they just didn't, didn't do a good job, and that's why their, their page comes to come slow. I mean, it, it, and, uh, you know, it's correct that if it was about Google and Microsoft and so on, maybe the consumers will know. But when it gets further down to, to other providers, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NYU, Columbia, they wouldn't know. I mean, it creates a burden on them which I don't think we should put on them. I just say that's a bad example, Nick, because we, nobody can imagine a situation where NYU got outbid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should look at the endowment of NYU and Columbia. And I think that we can see that. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I, think, I, I think, be careful here, that, that part of the point of a transparency rule on the consumer end is that if switching is reasonably something one could reasonably expect. And and there is a kind of the, you know, the, the cellophane fallacy sort of thing, which is they're going to raise the price high enough so you're, you would expect to see some of that, some churn at the margin. They may still have market power, but they've jacked the price up. Is is that um, is that if, if people could, if, if switching was, was widely feasible, that, that an ISP could say, we follow the net neutrality rules, as Nick Economides would like them, drafted. And in some sense, if people liked that, you know, might the marketplace respond? I think that's part of the idea is, is, that it, is it would help with that. And so that's sort of the question in some sense is, I mean, it might not work because the turn rates are so low, enough people are locked in, they're really not going to matter that much or whatever. I mean, you, you know, but uh, that, I mean, that's in some sense what the transparency benefit allegedly is. I'm just wondering what people think about that. And that it basically facilitates people to compete on the basis of, in some sense, promising net neutrality on its own, and if whatever benefits of that exceed the cost, people can... I'm yeah. not sure I understand 100 percent. You're saying suppose we have no net neutrality rules, but then some ISPs on their own decide to adopt net neutrality. Is That's that right. And, 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 and a transparency yeah. could work in such a way that that was a, you know, a credible, trustworthy claim. And again, that's that if you say, well, that could never happen, then. That's, I mean, but I, th but I think that's sort of the object. Part of the object of the policy is, in some sense, is to facilitate. Uh, that side of it, that, that is to supply arguably some sort of customer consumer discipline on bad network management practices. You know, I keep getting junk slowly for whatever reason. Netflix isn't showing up, or whatever it is. You know, hey, I hear that. You know, you know, these guys say that. You know, we don't do this kind of thing. We treat everybody equally. You know, that sounds good. So they go there, whatever that might be. You know, whether that's feasible, comprehensible, something that could be used as a as a as a differentiation device in competition among well, they, ISPs. Obviously, That's, they do differentiate. I mean, yeah. they're, they're competing on those margins. We're talking about uh, maybe customers are not so responsive, but at the end, yeah. uh, the reason you're getting the amount of, of uh, neutrality or the amount of non-neutrality is because there's an equilibrium, you know, based upon current conditions. But, um, you know, again, some of this discrimination, uh, I'll, I'll give the radical example, uh, digital phone service. Mm -hmm. So for many years, the number one priority 
of telecommunications regulators was to get head-to-head -head fixed line phone competition. Many would say that was the primary goal or task of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Mm -hmm. It finally came when uh, the cable networks that are wired to uh, near 100 percent of U.S. households uh, offered what they call digital phone service, which is voice over internet, using dedicated bandwidth on their platform. That is bandwidth for an application they own mm -hmm. that is denied to competing services like Vonage or Skype. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the, I mean, the cable customers, uh, you know, some of the internet bandwidth, some of the cable modem goes over to the phone customers. There is preference there because that's, you know, th that's the service you have to pay for. But uh, it's a service that the, the company sells. Well, that delivered a, a wonderfully competitive outcome mm -hmm. in the fixed line phone market. And we have competition now, and over 20 million subscribers of the alternative fixed line phone system. But, uh, you know, that's an example of non neutrality, certainly preference, given to uh, a service that's owned by the ISP. And, it, and it's efficient, I would argue. Certainly in its competitive outcome. Yes. Go ahead. Maybe I can say something on, the, on, on this. I mean, it, it, okay. it's an interesting thought, Tim, and an interesting possibility, theoretically, to, to say. Well, what would what would be the world if there was competition, which some firms were for net neutrality and some of them were were not for the net neutrality? But unfortunately, I'm afraid this is not the world we're in, because we have seen the filings of the various I, major ISPs, and they are not proposing s supporting net neutrality. I haven't seen a single filing of a major ISP saying yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So if that were the case, that there were major ISPs that were saying that, we would be, it would be an interesting world. Nick, I mean, yeah, Nick, I don't understand they're supporting right. the 2010 Bruce. rules, so um, I, I just disagree with, uh, with that statement. Sorry, go ahead, John. Okay, John I please. just want to make uh, one quick economic point about your, your uh, general uh, question here, which is even if um, uh, the, you could somehow uh, make it possible for all the, uh, the uh, consumers to vote with their pocketbooks for right. net neutrality, which is the world you're trying to construct. And there's some question. There's a lot of question about whether Und the consumers would actually understood. be able to do that and all that. But even if you can make that work, remember the future consumers aren't going to have the vote uh, either. And you know this is the Chris's spillover's point uh, uh, too. You're not really getting all the all of the. Uh, votes of everybody who will benefit from uh, uh, an, an open internet uh, in, uh, to uh, in, in, to uh, uh, invest in the policy. Okay. Um, believe it or not, I have more questions, but believe it or not, we don't have much time. So I think what we'd like to do now is uh, turn it over to the chairman for some last words, if he has any. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's what I was told. <laughs> well, I'll follow your instructions, Tim. Um, no. the, the, uh, let me just say, Commissioner Russell, Russell is here. Are you got anything you want to say? Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to ask one generic question of, of, of this group that's been going around in my head as I've been listening to you. Uh, is the Internet economy different from the industrial economy because innovation is from distributed small companies that have an unprecedented ability to scale that wasn't available previously? And if so, then what is the role in assuring, and what, what is the economic model that will assure the continuance of that? At least in my opinion, uh, it, it, you're right. I mean, it is quite different than the industrial economy, and the, your observation is correct that uh, people come in at very low costs, and they can scale up very quickly, um, and they have uh, a very significant impact on the rest of the economy, and that's why I think it's crucially important that we allow, we afford them that possibility. We allow them to do this uh, this thing. And the allowance, the being allowed to do that ends up depending on a terminating monopoly. Yes. 
uh, it, it depends on on being able to make sure there is no, in my opinion, that there is no paid prioritization, given the fact that there is a terminated monopoly, and I won't go into that in detail. So, but I'm not sure that the premise is entirely right, though. Uh, uh, I'm just thinking about. Uh, uh, the, the 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 difference may be more in uh, uh, degree than kind. I, because when the uh, inter- when the industrial revolution came along, a lot w- one of the things that happened is a lot of markets that were formerly very local became national or, or global even, right. and uh, uh, and and that made it possible to have very large firms in all kinds of uh, uh, different industries. You know, from oil refining to, to speed, retailing. John, not to with the speed. No, it didn't happen. Saying, I mean, they, they, that's the, correct. The velocity of the network is driving having a velocity of change that's unprecedented. I, I agree it's happening much more quickly. So now. so then what is the economic theory that makes sure that that continues? Because that's the essence of the future of this country. Well, it's the theory that got us here. It's the, it's the regime that, that brought it. And that regime has done very well. And, uh, you know, we, we <laughs> it, it's, it's a non sequitur to say, boy, uh, isn't this a stellar example of a distributed economy with, uh, you know, these modular elements? Very impressive. In many ways, it is like other industries. But you're right about the ability to scale quickly. That's something we really haven't seen. It's just, it's wonderful. The market's supporting it. The capital markets are supporting it. Where is all this coming from? It's coming from a system where you can have what you're calling a terminating monopolist. Okay, and that's, you know, obviously a prejudicial term, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, to, you know, to put it mildly, but I, 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 I'm glad that I'm glad that we st- stuck with us long enough. I knew this was going to happen. I could say the words, "I agree with Jonathan Baker." <laughs> and, uh, then I'll end my questioning there. I, 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 um, so yes, um, uh, you have put your finger on something that that uh, this is special. It's not like any other industry, and, and that's why it's deserving of of special scrutiny and even. What I'm advocating for is certain protections. The question is, um, is its specialness, does that imply a zero price rule or a per se prohibition on priority? Do we have to, do we have to give them such protections that they're never exposed to the possibility of a non-discriminatory price that's available to, to all, right? And, and I don't think it gets you there. It is special. You could argue it, as a result it's deserving of, of certain protections. But does that get you to the, to, in my mind, the radical prescription of a zero price for priority? And the answer is no. I'm not sure how radical this is since that sits in practice. There's been Jonathan, we don't talk <laughs> about zero price rules in any other uh, 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 We've economy had an open in the country for a long time uh, without. Uh, uh, but zero price rules, we just don't talk about. It. We're actually well, having a conversation a about a zero cost price cost rule here. I mean, this is a zero cost margin in the marginal cost <laughs> industry. True, why shouldn't it have a zero price? I mean, wait, wait a second. I mean, it uh, has had a zero price. No, I mean, but that's the internet what I'm, evolves. But, there are new but, conditions. But he's saying we shouldn't have zero price. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you shouldn't have a rule. It's not a whether or not you have the zero price. Yeah, zero prices work great. Bill and keep, you know, the core of the Internet, the peering arrangements, zero price rules. No, they're not rules. They're outcomes. So there's a lot of difference between the two. But, you know, I also think that what you're getting at does have uh, analogs in previous industrial revolutions. It's and, and particularly, it's been one of the great strengths of America that when the new general purpose technology has come along, in this country, small firms, large firms, any firm has had unfettered access to it. They could use the steam engine. They could use. They could ship via the railway network. They could access the electricity network on a non-discriminatory, open, permissionless innovation basis. That wasn't true in a lot of European countries, for example. You had to, you know, you really had to go through a lot more rigmarole to, say, get access to the railroads or something like that. And that, that has driven our industrial revolutions. But that was, but, but that was only, way. that was only after regulation was imposed on railroads or whatever. I mean, and because you know, the Grange organized for the very yeah, purpose it. that there was uh, activities by the railroads that, that were preferential and, and prejudicial. That, I think that's an interesting point, yeah. Well, yeah, but I, I advise you to read the history of regulation of uh, railroads and the uh, interstate commerce, the abolished Interstate Commerce Commission, abolished for a good reason, 
that it, it did that's not, not lower. That's, it not did not lower we were, that's not the issue we were discussing. The issue we were discussing was, was, was there a cause that triggered regulation? Yes. You read that history, that's clear. Then you go off into how the regulation was done, which is, I think, where, where you're going, Tom. But was there a cause? Now, if we are at that kind that. of an inflection point today, mm -hmm. all right, where we have this new network that restructures the economy, how do you make sure that you preserve the potential that appears to be represented by that network? I would hope we wouldn't repeat the mistakes of the Interstate Commerce I, Commission. I, I, <laughs> well and I, I would hope we protect Tim, the I'm just happy circle. that we, we've got more fire out of these this group in the last five minutes from this question than uh, <laughs> in the previous couple hours. So I feel that I've been successful in uh, yes, you, yes. what I was trying to accomplish. Yes, you have. <laughs> Thank but, you. Um, okay. um, Does Tim still work here? <laughs> <laughs> so, decision to be made later. Former um, chief economist, because I mean, Tim may. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard, Tim. <laughs> um, thanks to you all for uh, for coming. Thanks to the uh, um, commissioners and chairman for participating, and uh, thanks especially to the panel. This has just been great. I've, I uh, I wish I weren't having to sit here do this because I could have taken even more notes and learned even more than I did and I'll be back looking at this again to uh oh yeah that was a good point so I'm looking forward to that uh thank this has been a great service to everybody thanks very much really appreciate it thank thanks. you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.